It's the Almost Perfect Podcast. Welcome to the Almost Perfect Podcast, a celebration of fuck-ups, failures, and falling flat on your face. This is a podcast that believes you can learn from experience, but that experience doesn't have to be your own. Ha, I'm Bob Perfect, and I'm a functional fuck-up. Let's learn from somebody else's mistakes, and today we're learning from Luke Mulver. Now, Luke is a comic book creator. I say creator because he does the whole thing when it comes to putting a comic book together. Um, he, you know, draws them, he writes the stories, he writes the dialogue, he inks them, he creates the entire book uh, when it comes to his comics. So yeah, that's why I call him a creator. And he has created some pretty interesting comic books that I've enjoyed a lot. Um, I've only really read the Sunday Slave series now, I've read two of those, and then I read some of the uh, the noir series that he had, like, uh, I can't remember what it was called right now, and that's so bad, I should have notes in front of me, but uh, the book that I read was Remembering Emma, and, you know, it was really cool that he plays stuff in Durban in that book, like, the Winston pub was there, it was like the cyberpunk version of Durban, and it was like a cool noir story line involved in that, and I, you know, I was struck by that years ago, well, not that long ago, but it was, it was a few years ago now that he put that out, and I'd always known Luke, you know, on the periphery, uh, we go to the same places, we like the same kind of things, and we've had a lot of conversations over the years, and so it was cool to actually interact with his art, and now it was really cool to have a conversation with him about his art, and just in general, because if you know Luke, uh, you know he has a lot of opinions, and if you don't know Luke, well, you're about to find out that he has a lot of opinions, one of which might be a little surprising, he hates superheroes, so uh, yeah, weird for a comic artist to hate superheroes, but we get into why. Uh, we also just break down so much in pop culture at the moment, in comic book culture at the moment. Uh, it's a really like nerdy discussion, like this one's just like two people having a long ass conversation about like comic books and characters that they love and hate. And we also do get into, you know, what it's like to be a comic book creator in South Africa. Uh, if you've listened to one of the previous episodes, I've also chatted to another comic artist, uh, Nas Husson. He's also a comic creator who I reckon you go check out. So go check out the previous episode after this one. Um, and then, yeah, Luke and I, we have such a rad conversation just, as I say, about just, you know, all the things we love and hate about, you know, comics and the world around them. From the MCU to the DCEU, which is cock. Uh, I'm just gonna say it straight up, fuck the DCEU, but I'm looking forward to the new Joker movie, and we discuss that, but like I said, we also get into what it's like to be a South African creator, um, the struggles, and the, you know, tribulations, the, those, those do happen, that's why cats do this, that's why, you know, people like Luke get into a small industry, because they're passionate about it, and there actually are a lot of benefits to it, when you work your ass off for years and years and years, and eventually, you know, things kind of break your way. And things have been breaking, you know, Luke's way lately. He's going overseas, I think, uh, either this year or next year, uh, to receive an award. Uh, he discusses that just now in the podcast, so we'll get into that. Um, he's, you know, done some pretty big things. He's a part of a really cool uh, project at the moment called uh, Shaka Rising. I would recommend you go check it out. It's like an educational type comic book. Uh, which we discuss, and, you know, we discuss the politics of that, of being a white dude, you know, writing black characters, but uh, I think Luke handles it pretty well, uh, a lot of research, and it's not just him doing it, he is working with other people who are researching pretty well, and providing a good story, so I haven't actually read Shaka Rising yet, but I have read about it, and I have seen the reviews, and people have really seemed to dig that, and so, you know, between that, between his personal work, and between you know, the other stuff that pays the bills, it's, it's a lot, but at the same time, it's, you know, he's following his passion, and that's something that I obviously really appreciate, and I love comic books, I love comics, I love the whole thing, so I'm super stoked we got to have this conversation, and I think you're going to enjoy it as well, you're, you're already in, like, if you saw two hours, and you've clicked it, and you're now listening to this, you're gonna listen to the whole thing, and you're probably gonna have a good time, so thanks for clicking play, and thank you to everyone who has signed up to the Patreon account. Um, I'm actually giving the beers. I would, like If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know I've got a case of beers to give away. And I'm literally giving them away in like an hour from now. So Ryan Reno, you're going to be getting your beers, yeah. 
and I'm doing another giveaway. Actually, this one's for everyone. It's not just for the patrons. And if you want to know more about that, just go to uh, patreon.com almost forward slash almost perfect. Uh, just go there if you want to know what the Patreon vibe is. Uh, but other than that, on just social, well, on what socials? On iTunes. Yes, on iTunes. I need reviews, guys. Please, please help me here. I need some reviews out there. Uh, it really helps with the, with the rankings. I had a weird, like, awkward vibe last night. So I was at this cool uh, Red Bull I'm a Pico meet and greet thing because I work with Red Bull a bit these days. And yeah, it was a cool thing. And like, I was mentioning my podcast to someone, and then they like searched it on iTunes and literally typed it the almost perfect podcast and it was like five down. Like, it wasn't the first thing. So if you could please go leave reviews and ratings there. I'm going to give you something for it. I'm going to give you free entry for you and three friends, plus a 250 rand bar tab to the Winston pub sometime next month. You can pick the day that you go in and you and your homies can go and, you know, have a good time. Maybe enjoy some dope local acts, some of whom I might have interviewed before. Go check the back catalog. Uh, maybe some of whom I'm going to interview in the future. Either way, go check it out and also go check out the interview with Matt Olafia, who owns the Winston pub. Um, I'm also going to be giving, so yeah, so that's the thing, I'm giving that away, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting a little distracted here, but uh, yeah, so that's the thing, we're giving away a 250 rand bar tab and free entry for four people to the Winston pub, all you got to do is leave a review, okay, leave a review on iTunes, then take a screenshot of that, use the snippet tool or use whatever you need to use, even take a photo with like your phone if you don't know how to you know screenshot on a computer or whatever just just get me the image of your review send it to me you can do that via the inbox on uh, facebook you can do that via twitter that's bobness monster or almost underscore podcast uh, you can also just email me emailing me is probably the best way and that is almost perfect pod at gmail.com so yeah Go leave a review, send the screenshot, and who knows, maybe I'll be giving you a bar tab and free entry for your friends to a kiff jaw of your choice. I'll also be giving away some free entry to another gig next month. I'll be letting you know about that pretty soon. And just in general, if you are someone who, uh, yeah, wants to work with me, hit me up. Almostperfectpod at gmail.com. I'm happy to promote your stuff, uh, depending on what it is, especially if it's, you know, related to the podcast and the guests on the podcast. So yeah, hit me up if you want me to promote something for you to the listeners of the show, especially if you are a listener of the show, that works out amazingly. So hit me up, and without further ado, this has been a little bit of a long intro, sorry about that, but thank you for making it this far, and I hope you make it through the next two hours of uh, nonsense from myself and Luke Mulver. Enjoy! So how are you living, Billy Pineapples? Hey, Bob. <laughs> how are you doing, man? Well, Good to a, be here. AKA Luke Mulver, as some people call you. Yeah. Or, or uh, as I think you like to be called these days. No, actually, I'm trying to go by my actual name now that I'm, I'm sort of building a career out of what I do. Billy Pineapples um, <laughs> was uh, an alias. Well, I'll give you the quick story if you want. Yeah, please. Um, back in the <laughs> days of uh, crude technology and before Facebook came along... And cruder uh, youths. Yes, cruder youths. Um, mis misspent youth. Um, I was uh, always a big fan of 2000 AD. There was this, this character, this robot assassin called Joe, jo like Joe Pineapples. Okay, that was Judge Dredd, right? Uh, yeah, Judge Dredd, ABC Warriors. Um, and I also, uh, in an entirely separate uh, factor, I had this, this garish hawaiian shirt that was covered in pineapples that i enjoyed wearing to parties i remember that phase yeah i still got the shirt ironically enough but um i wanted to just create this this sort of uh, this persona um because this facebook thing had come along i was like well what am i going to call myself i don't want to put my real information out there um billy pineapples you don't do. put your government name on the internet my government name um, coincidentally, although it didn't occur to me at the time, my middle name is William, so Billy fit quite well. But uh, at the time, I just thought it sounded cool. It bounced off the tongue, Billy Pineapples. 
And then after a while, uh, I started being introduced to new people by my friends as Billy Pineapple. So I was kind of cornered into the continuity of this character. Yeah, I'd, I'd... Th- that's kind of the Bob story. <laughs> like... Yeah, I mean, I remember from, from your your own, yourself podcast, the, oh, the origin story. Oh, of, you actually of, listened of to that? Wow. Course, man. I can't you know, believe. Like... I had to do some preparation. <laughs> that one, oh, you had to do some prep. <laughs> I probably should have done some. Nah, I did. I reread your Sunday Slave comic earlier today. I mean, I got remembering Emma from your... Near reverse, and then yeah, I reread Sunday Slave because you were bringing the second copy to me today. Uh, what is the new book uh, that you worked on that you've just put out? The new uh, Sunday Slave. The new Sunday Slave, not that um, rising. We'll talk about that. The rising, Sunday Slave is a comic because uh, I was working my Nero series was pretty was sort of cyberpunk South African sci-fi. I set it in Durban. I took influence from stuff like Blade Runner, Akira, Mad yeah. Max. Um, yeah, well, those are all things I was going to mention yeah. about it. Like, and I, that's what I love about it. There's also, there's a, like, weird, um, what's his name? Frank uh, Miller. Miller. A little bit. There's a bit of a Frank Miller vibe to it as well going on yeah, there. Like, definitely. in the characterization, like, in the, you know, scene setting, there's a lot of, like, yeah, the Blade Runner kind of vibes yeah. and stuff. Well, like, I wanted to combine, like, uh, one of my favorite genres is sci-fi, obviously, but also sort of crime, crime noir. Kind yeah, of and that, that's... boiled stuff. That's what it is, yeah. Um, so, I was working on that back in sort of, uh, I think the first one came out 2013. Um, but they were so long, as uh, we were talking earlier. These volumes, I wanted to create these epic long-form stories, but they were each like 70 pages. So the first volume came out, I was stoked. Um, but then it took me like three years to get the next one out, because in between, I've got to do actual legitimate graphic design work to pay the rent. Yeah. Um, but uh, And then I released the second one, and it was cool. And then suddenly Cyberpunk became very mainstream. Suddenly so, everyone so was you doing were like, like altered pivot. carbon and, you know, and more than that, it actually became the reality of the world. So why, um, so why wouldn't you like keep like, you know, s- steer into the skin? No, like, since it becomes cool, I get bored of it. <laughs> so, uh, I've noticed. You know. Um, such a hipster. But <laughs> I suppose I am. <laughs> like original hipsters, like the original, that's the original and, and, definition yeah. of a hipster. Yeah. I was a hipster before everyone else was a hipster. You're like Brody from fucking, <laughs> <laughs> what's my call it, uh, more rats, like. I'm going to take that as high praise. <laughs> it is high praise. Um, but after Nero, the, the, se- the second one came out, I'd sort of concluded most of the main arc. And I really just wanted to dabble in something else. Um, also being the sole writer and, and artist, it, it, it made things even longer to get out. So I went with, uh, I love the blues, blues music. Yeah. Um, and I love sort of fables stories that are are mired both in historical fact and mythology um and one such fable i've always loved is the story of robert johnson yeah the musician who made uh one of the deal first members the of the 27 club and a musician who made a deal with the devil at the crossroads for supreme guitar skills allegedly um and i wanted to sort of work work that story into a, a, a sort of a, kind of horror a horror tale oh mm, i didn't pick up that it was horror like i get that it's got oh, that it's gothic co- it, it's it's, oh, it's, oh, it's, it's is that where we're heading horrific. yeah i guess there's some good okay because like, oh, okay because i mean it's well it's got a preacher-esque quality to it yeah like, thank you um yeah and yeah that that sort of writing the writing of goth ennis um uh, uh warren ellis who did a, a comic called trans metropolitan yes um, and Frank Miller, as you mentioned. Oh, yeah, it's, I can influences. definitely actually see the Transmetropolitan, even in uh, Nero. Like, yeah, 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 Nero also, definitely. Um, but also the, the love of sort of crime stories, small-time crime, character-driven works uh, infused Sunday Slave. So the difference between Nero and Sunday Slave was I wanted to do shorter form. I mean, it can tell a long-form story, but I wanted to get it out at least one a year. Like episodic, um, yeah. Yeah, so I went for a sort of 22, 25 page format. What, what which do you mean a, one a year? Like Marvel's, hey, rele- for me. Marvel's releasing like, you know, like what, five Spider-Man yeah, a month? I don't know. <laughs> They're churning them out like they think we're going to forget what a superhero is. <laughs> Um, but we'll get oh, I have things to say <laughs> no, about superheroes. I, 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 know we'll you, I know you do. We'll talk. But um, but yeah, and, and Sunday Slave has been very well received. Uh, I launched uh, the second issue this year at FanCon um, last month in Cape Town, the local comic book convention. Yep. Uh, it's really cool to actually, e- even though these are self-published works, and I, I print maybe 200 copies, um, 
it's really cool to actually have people who've come back from last year and they come to my table and they're like, where's the next issue? I want to see it. And thankfully and you actually had the second issue. Yeah. <laughs> well, there were a couple of the conventions in between. I didn't. So <laughs> I felt like I'd crush these, these fans, you know. Did you not have any Nero's left? Or? I had Nero's, but again, like not I said, that's same. been since 2013. They yeah. I read that. Um, uh, you're, you've, so your fans have read all your work now. And like, I have fans. You have fans now. Oh, that's so cute. But um, it's just encouraging because comic books as a medium are inherently quite isolationist yeah, you know you, even if you're working in a team it's a production line team it's not like you're, oh, you're not in the film. same room at all yeah you're not it's not like you're on a film set and you're all working together or, no or, someone does the drawing someone else does the inking someone then does the coloring like it's all done by different people different yeah. places you write the story you do like yeah but for me i do all of that exactly um so it it was and sometimes one forgets. I forget that you know I'm right. I'm so close to these characters. I'm writing them because it's something I would like to read. That when I, people actually come and say, "Hey, we love this," you know, we read we read it, we dig it, and they start telling me what they thought of the story. It's it's a little strange. But actually, that, that's but, the point, obviously. But, but yeah, but haven't you always wanted that? Haven't because yeah. you've done that with other people, haven't you? What, what do you mean? Like, like you, like with other people, you've become a fan of them. You've met oh, yeah, them, no, and you've no, been absolutely. like, "I love your work." Absolutely, like, but then, but then it's it's weird to have. So, I mean, I fanboy hard over like you know international guests at FanCon or Comic Con, and when I meet you've also people, gone overseas sometimes a lot, obscure like, idols that someone who isn't familiar with comics would have no idea about. But I'm like, I'm drooling, I'm stuttering, <laughs> I'm stammering, and so then when people come to me asking me for autographs and saying, "I love your work," you know, it's, it's kind of. It's surreal in a way, but I'm eternally so, grateful. So you're not like at that middle place because, to... like, you've gone overseas to conventions where you've done this. And you, these guys come here, like, yeah, you know, and so you're like this guy looking asking for autographs, and now you're in that middle place of you're still asking for autographs. <laughs> like when you see someone you care about, you're like, you're please gonna have your autograph. But at yeah. the same time, now people are actually like coming and asking for yours. Typically, when I do meet someone whose autograph I want, I'll get the autograph and I'll also force a hamper pack of my own comics into their hands. Oh, that's the Just classic. so they can come back one day and ask me for my autograph. You mm, know? Maybe. But, um, but yeah, stuff like that, like um, at, at, at FanCon, this, uh, and touch on FanCon briefly. Yeah, definitely. Please do. Like, I wanted to talk about it. FanCon is a is a Cape Town Comic Con. Um, it bre- it, it's been it, around for a long time. Now. Yeah, it evolved out of a free comic book day, which was run by a comic book shop called Reader's Den in Cape Town. They're still going. Uh, yeah, free Reader's Den is still going. Free comic book day is still going as a as a different event. But FanCon is essentially the first south african comic con yeah not con comic con yeah we've well, oh yeah cons. we've had icon we've had like all that we've had rage we've had icon, like gaming rage, edge but a lot of that stuff is geared towards gaming, gaming and also like mythology and like um so it's more lord of the rings than spider-man like yeah well, yeah um yeah absolutely uh and, and but even comic con itself the big one we had the first debut comic con africa last year in joburg because according to overseas it's all one place it's <laughs> yeah comic con joburg it's comic con africa but even that it was massive it was huge there's a lot to see um but it was almost uh, at sort of a, a top heavy critical mass i didn't even see half the stuff um yeah i mean but, but that's what big cons are like yeah but uh, but FanCon is specifically geared towards comic books and local creators, and they get very cool international guests. And a lot of the guests have said over the years. I mean, it's been going officially. I think this is its fourth, fifth year of FanCon. Um, but the guests have said that because these international guys, they go to a lot of international cons, the big stuff, San Diego, New York, um, Las Vegas. But those must be pretty tiring for them. Yeah, and they're so huge. I mean, from uh, from accessibility to those artists, if I went to... You'd get 10 seconds. You'd get, if you even got to the front of the queue, if there wasn't a $60 charge to even see oh, yeah, just say, yeah, like by the at way, FanCon, I one, was sitting one second across... Quickly. Uh, just so everyone knows listening we're drinking beers at the moment so if you hear some weird burps and like some audio things because both of us I can see are uh, having that issue so uh, just a just a little heads up to the people listening you might hear one or two burps here pops and feedback (laughs) Uh, where Um, were you sorry but yeah like at FanCon uh, one of the guests was a guy called John Higgins um, uh, an artist on on stuff uh, from uh, on Judge Dredd since 1977 since its outset uh on Watchmen, uh, he was the colorist yeah, on Watchmen, yeah. uh, on The Killing Joke, uh, also oh, by Alan Moore. 
heard and of all of this these. guy i mean i've re- grown up with this guy's work and he's sitting five meters away from me right there his table looks exactly the same as my table at fancon i'm selling my comics he's selling his and there's like there's no one there and <laughs> i'm almost like i, I want to if, if i spoke loud enough he could hear me but it's just that sort of accessibility and the guests themselves have said that you don't find it in the larger cons so FanCon is actually at the sweet spot right now. It may yet grow bigger. And I mean, that's I mean, the problem is it's in Cape Town, so it can become an international thing. And then like, yeah. well, the, yeah, um, but it's so cool having this, this focus on, on local comics that it's not like they, I mean, they don't, they don't neglect other pop culture, but they, they make it specific. It's not a gaming convention. It's not a TV show convention. It's comics. It's local comics. And meeting the other creators, these international guests, hearing their panels, and which are all like, I mean, that, that intimate, a small panel, small panel. Rooms, yeah, like 30 people. Audiences, like If that. Okay. Um, I mean, because there's not a lot of people who want to learn how to write like comics in South well, Africa. You, I, I, th- I thought that myself, but even the the less than 30 people at these panels they're all there because they want to be there it's yeah. not like they've just wandered in because no but that's what i see no, they want to see they that's, hear. but that's what i mean like you know it's not going to be like it's not like other cons where it's you know you have a bunch of celebrities talking about the next film this is yo if you want to learn how to draw comics like you know this is how you start this is how you get into it you know you want if you already make your own comics this is how you publish them this is Absolutely. all of that like those are and that's Practical very useful and for, exactly but that doesn't have a broad base appeal it doesn't but i still think it, it no i think it's incredibly to, necessary i'm not dismissing yeah. this i'm just conf- complain like because like you know people listening might think fuck 30 people that's not a lot and i'm just trying to explain that yeah, because it's not a lot of people in South Africa who want to know that specific knowledge. It's still very cool that there are those yeah. like 30 people who have access to that knowledge as well, which is what's amazing now. And I think because of stuff like VanCon, the industry is growing. Like it's to me, it looks like it's growing. I see more comics from South Africa being coming out every year. Like it sucks that Dion's like shop like closed down. It was Dion Dalaga who had that comic? Uh, shop. Yeah. There is a new, there is a new uh, online store comic. No, there's a new comic book shop in Durban. Oh, no, no, I know that, but he had the online store. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was indie pretty... comics essay. That was it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. There's but uh, the community is resilient, but as with and you know this from from you you know stand up comedy. <laughs> from these lots communities of things, yeah. are, are are resilient, but they are often small and they often struggle. But um, it's if you are passionate about what you do, what you do, what I do, any creative field really. It's not like you can stop. No, <laughs> you can't. What else are we gonna do? So that's that that sturdiness comes in. Um, and uh, events like FanCon, and I don't want to give the impression that it wasn't well attended because it was. Uh, no, we're two, just talking about event, those little but, conferences, yeah. But um, but the people who are there want to be there for very specific reasons. It's not like I mean, people Comic Con might be, and again, I'm not tuning Comic Con, but Comic Con is something like it's got literally everything. So a casual, you can see, oh, Jason Momoa is going to be there. You know, yeah. I'm going, and that's the reason people go. Yeah. They have no interest in anything else. No, well, it's, it um, is. They're like once they're there, it's okay, cool. It's, actually it's a, a general, cool stuff. yeah, it's a general spectacle. Like it's like they know they're going to have a good time because yeah. I'm familiar with all these characters. I like that. I I, I like Spider Man. I watched the comic, like well, the cartoon on Saturdays I or whatever. The movie, didn't you? Yeah, I watched the movie as well. I, what do you mean? I I like Tom Holland as Spider Man. Fuck you. I haven't seen it. I shit on it, but oh, you're an idiot though. Like Tom Holland as Spider Man is amazing. He's beautiful. He's perfect. He's he's my Spider Man. No, no, he's cool. I mean, I, I I'm sure he is. Um. I'm not a huge Spider-Man fan, even in the comic stuff. I found a snappy one-line is almost as irritating as, as Deadpool's, Deadpool's breaking I knew the fourth you were, wall. I knew you were going to say that. Breaking the fourth wall is cheap writing, man. It is hack exposition. <laughs> it is ridiculous nonsense. Uh, so and, and that is actually one of the better superhero movies. With Deadpool. Yeah, yeah, the first one. The second one was... I haven't seen the second one. Yeah. I haven't seen the first one. <laughs> Oh, do you do this a lot? Do you give opinions of things that you've never seen? Yeah, I, but I can. I can. Oh, can you? Because, oh, can you? Because they're all the same movie. 21 superhero Marvel MCU movies. It's the same movie. You're watching two-hour trailers for another Yeah, I mean, movie. I haven't watched all of the MCU movies. Oh, you don't need to. I've seen the ones that I care about. Did you see Endgame? Yes. Yeah, give me some spoilers. I haven't seen it. I don't give a shit. 
It's uh, not like the way. Hang on. Let me predict what okay, happens. Cap, Cap says Hail Hydra. Okay, I knew that. I think that was the coolest thing they could have done. They did that in the comic as well. Yeah, and, and it it's so many people off. And it's also kind of weirdly similar reasons, but very different like storyline vibes. But it's he does it, you know, to fool the like Hydra people, like uh, it's, it's <sighs> sneaky, sneaky Steve. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fuck Cap. Like just as a character and as everything in general. But I, in the I movies, just, he was fine. Listen. Okay. Let, let's yeah. Let's talk. Let's, let's talk, talk superheroes. Let's, talk let's superheroes. go for it. As a disclaimer, first of all, I would like to say that like fuck I would Superman. Not, I would not. I do not prescribe what it, what people can enjoy. Enjoy whatever you want, man. Escapism is cool. Top ten highest grossing movies are all crap, but enjoy what you want. Yeah, you're something like Star Wars. No, I do like Star Wars. Oh, you do? Okay. Um, but well, some of it. Because there's no superheroes in it. <laughs> there's no superheroes in Star Wars. Really? Wait, just hang on a second. So Nobody in there has some superpowers and, like, saves people. It, as a disclaimer, <laughs> enjoy what you want. Uh, I don't prescribe uh, what people like in their cinema or their literature or their comic books. Um, and after that disclaimer, let me now proceed to shit upon what you like. Mm-hmm. I don't dislike superheroes inherently. I like superheroes the same way I like religion. It makes a great framework to tell interesting stories in. Yeah. I'm not religious, but without that sort of that, that, oh, that history. The, well, that's like, of, I like mythology. I wouldn't, I would, something like Sunday Slave would not exist. Well, yeah. That, without that, the concept of the devil, Sunday yeah. Slave couldn't exist. Well, yeah. Without religion, the concept of the devil was well, like. Yeah, um, no, dude, I love, mytho- religion is I love mythology. I love mythology, and that's kind of why, like, yeah. And, and what is religion, really? Yeah, that's that. what, exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> like, I don't. I'd see a difference in that, like, mythology is just dead religion. Like, essentially, with better stories. Way better stories. Hey, the Bible's a cool book, man. Bubbles of fiction. Uh, it's not that Old Testament stuff is pretty cool. It's like all blood uh, and thunder and vindictive God. And... Yeah, but it's also just like, oh, like it's the same shit over and over again. Like the, it's very repetitive. Oh yeah, sound like a superhero movie to me. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I mean, that is the issue with superhero movies is that they can be incredibly predictable. Like that's just. The problem. Spoiler alert. Uh, having not seen Infinity War or Endgame, let me guess what happens. Oh, you've okay. read the spoilers. You know what's well, happened. Well, you've read some of the spoilers. But okay, so everyone, half, half the team dies in Infinity War or something, right? Yeah. Okay. Once again, you've read the comics, haven't you? No. Well, you, not, you never... I mean, not up to that. I haven't read a superhero comic in a while. I really oh, no, but Infinity stuff. War was like 90s. Like, shit. The last one I read was, I think, well, the Ultimates. Well, it wasn't Infinity War. It was the, beginning, it was the beginning of like... the MCU. I read the Ultimates back in... Yeah, that's that was 2000. That was after yeah. that. But anyway. Um, so everyone dies, or half the team dies, and let me guess, they come back in Endgame? Well, some of them. Okay. Wow. Most of them. How do I know that? This is one of the large problems I have. Have you, is, yeah, have you ever read no... a fucking comic book? <laughs> no, no, but it's, it's something inherent to superhero oh, yeah. comics is the fact I find, again, personal opinion, which I'm going to, I'm going to slather all over your audience, is that there's no emotional investment in characters if it is if as you know easy come as, back. oh, it's a time paradox. Oh, it's a parallel universe. Oh, it's Earth mc62 or something because they don't die they just come back i agree with you but it's also our addiction to those characters that like you know cre- like it's the audience that creates that like, yeah it, it is it's it, it, it's an audience that creates a franchise it's an audience that creates superhero movies the most but, colossal but monument the thing is, to creative yeah, mediocrity but the in thing contemporary is, world the thing is the comic yeah the thing is comic books can't kill their products like they just like if everyone loves Spider-Man, you can't fucking kill Spider-Man because then who's going to, like, what are you going to sell that? You it's can a, kill them. Yeah. And but you can... No, there's ways... No, there, there are. There's, there are it's more been creative done, ways to... It's been done really well and sometimes, and sometimes it hasn't. And, like, I like the alternative... U- oh, my bad. I like, I like, I love alternative universe stuff. Time travel? Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I, like, I love I love the alternative Elseworlds stuff. But, again, that stuff wouldn't be... And this is the framework I was talking about. That, that Those stories um, wouldn't be appeal it wouldn't make any sense if we weren't aware of the larger continuity of the characters yeah. like there was a one great elsewhere you, you you're not a fan of superman huh 
No. I'm not a huge fan of Superman. I do enjoy the mythology. I do, I do enjoy the death of Superman, but, but they've all was, been there pretty was a, enjoyable. There was a great Elseworlds. DC did a series called Elseworlds, and there was a great Superman story called Red Sun. Okay. And it took the very simple premise that what if Superman's escape pod from Krypton had crashed landed on landed a different planet? On, uh, it crashed landed on Earth an hour later. Uh. The, the spin of the Earth, well, I'm not sure of exact timeline, but the spin of the Earth landed him in communist Russia. Ooh. So he oh, I've up, heard about this. Yes, 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 yes. He grew yes. up as the Red Sun, and he grew up essentially as a villain. Um, he he becomes the, the this dictator leader of Russia. Pretty much, Russia becomes the one superpower, destroys America, and it's a red. Batman is in it. Batman plays this sort of Ushanka hat wearing terrorist who's fighting against super uh, Superman's regime. But the comic would make no sense I mean, that and have no like impact Zach's if he shit. didn't know what who Superman was. If Superman's continuity didn't exist. Oh, like you would because that would just be a story. Like that yeah, would, that would just like be would it be story shocking? About this guy who this villain know, and then this yeah, guy who it fought against. Would be a superhero story, but so I mean, I enjoy that sort of. There's there's also there's a Batman story written by Neil Gaiman who always likes to twist things up. Give him Batman and he does some extraordinary. Yeah, we we like I can I can assume you enjoy Gaiman as, as much it. as I do. Yeah. Um, but there's a Batman story which. Uh, typical gaiman it starts batman's funeral and it's an mm. open casket funeral all these people all these characters his rogues gallery the heroes the villains everyone in his life is rocking up to this dirty tenement building this warehouse and they go in and it's like this it's beautifully lit open casket and batman's in it mind you batman is in it he's wearing the mask it's not bruce wayne yeah. and he's he's dead this is the opening scene there's no explanation for, given for what's happened and then each of the characters starts stepping up and giving their own story. Um, uh, uh, Penguin, um, Catwoman, uh, Gre uh, Gre uh, the Riddler, Poison Ivy, and eventually Killer Alfred. Uh, uh, no, Probably not. Like, Kill Killer Croc isn't there. Probably not Killer Croc. Killer Croc isn't in there. But eventually Alfred steps up. And all the stories, the stories don't correlate. They all contradict one another. So you're not sure what's the truth. So they're jokering him there? Well, Alfred steps up, his butler. So I was telling the story about how he used to be in the sort of traveling circus troupe before he came into the, uh, the service of the Wayne family. Alfred was a thespian. He was an actor. He was, part of, he was a carny. Um, that, and he that came, makes sense when Michael Caine played him. He, he came into the service of the Wayne family. Um, the, uh, the, Bruce's parents were killed uh, in the alleyway, the, the origin story. Uh, that all stays the same. Young Bruce came under Alfred's wing as his ward. But... Bruce is damaged. Bruce is traumatized. Bruce never gets over that that the death of his parents. And yeah. he starts it's it's almost in some ways a quite an, a more accurate psychoanalysis of a very disturbed young man who grows into an obsessed adult. And Bruce starts he starts dressing up. He starts just going out and beating up petty thugs. He starts just putting on a bandana. He's like, I will avenge my parents. He's got the money to do it. And Alfred feeds this. I mean, obsession. Batman Begins kind of... It dab yeah, it, it dabbles in it. Even even the Zack Snyder of Batman sort of touches on it. Um, but Alfred continues the story and, and Bruce's, you, psychosis, no, Bruce's psychosis gets worse and worse until it's not it's not enough. He's taking the bikes out every night with a bandana on, but he's just he's beating up muggers. So Alfred calls some of his old troubadour buddies and he's like, listen, I need you to dress up. You need to make a character or something. I don't know, like a, a penguin. You know, you did that. You got the big nose in the carnival. Just dress up and go and go out into the street. I want to set up something. This and sounds then, awesome. And then, he gets, and then uh, you know, one of his old lovers is this this, uh, this woman, Selena Kyle. You know, um, just uh, cat woman. You know, there's a lot of cats in the city. A lot of stray cats. Just 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 make make it theatrical. What's the Selena Kyle and top tier name? Yeah, very cool. Uh, Michelle Pfeiffer is the one true cat woman. Anne Hathaway, yeah, I liked her. She was right, but um, and but then ultimately, it's and this feeds Batman's Bruce Wayne's obsession, but it's still not enough. It's still not enough, and ultimately, Alfred himself he goes into the bedroom and he stands in front of the mirror. He smears on the white grease paint and the red lipstick and the green dye through his hair. But How it have only I not read it only really works when he smiles, and Alfred's the Joker. How have I not read this? 
It's great. Just look up Neil Gaiman Batman. He wrote a few of them, and they're so out there. Yeah. But again, that is obviously not part of I've Batman read. canon. That is not part of Batman continuity, what, and it wouldn't work Gaiman, if we didn't read. know the story of Batman. Yeah, but that's also but whatever. I mean, that's cool. But though. it's, it's like, ingeniously written um, as a and and you you get the impression that this guy is a maniac. Batman, but Bruce Wayne is a severely damaged individual. Yeah, but also, he Batman is. is. He's the coolest because he's human. He's not super. That's why he's the best superhero. Well, that's he's not why. Super. That's why, like, Lu- Lex Luthor is cool because he's human. The Joker is cool. No, well, the Joker. Do you know? Like, what do you like? Have I don't know what's happened with the three Joker thing. This is what's going on there. Well, the Joker. Do you know what's happening with that story? The with the three Joker. Yeah. What's the three Joker? There's this whole thing that there's three Jokers. Well, the Joker's uh, originally he was never given a, a proper Cause, origin story. Cause in in, in uh, I think it was the Killing Joke. He's um, yeah. He says like I prefer the Fleck. He's this failed stand-up comedian. Yeah. And the new Joaquin Phoenix Joker is, movie, is, I think, is taking t- it's, touching on that. But like yeah. that actually looks cool. <laughs> it does. It does because it doesn't look like a superhero movie. Yeah. Um, and the, the, it, there's no, not Batman is nowhere in sight. Which is definitely one of the best things that can happen in a Batman story. I have high hopes for that Joker movie. Actually. Same. But I mean, um, I the love Joker, because, looking, I find I mean, he's such a cool character is because he's so infinitely rewritable. But that's he the has point no official origin story. That's why I think the various incarnations, more than any other character um, on the page and particularly on screen, whether it be Jack Nicholson's sort of austere mobster Joker, Heath Ledger's, you know, anarchist punk rock fucking slit lip Joker. Uh, we'll skip Jared Leto's Joker. What is <laughs> Phoenix's Joker, which looks like, I mean, sort of humanized, uh, traumatized comedian. Yeah. And I think they all work in their own way because each of those actors has realized that. They're like, don't try and play the Joker like the last guy. But I mean, like in the comics, though, like uh, in a recent, well, not that recent, probably like last year or maybe, I can't even remember when, like Batman, he he, like could, he spoke to a being that like knew all the questions of, knew the answers in the universe and he asked, or or the computer, it was the computer. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he asked the question, like, who is the Joker? And they said that's it was, the question you want to ask, Bruce. Really, is that the question you want to ask? Yeah, and like it said, like the Joker was like three different people. I, I well, it was yeah. I, you I haven't, haven't kept up. Okay, entirety, okay. Sorry, but, like yeah. I so can, that's I can say I will tentatively say that that is trying to drag the Joker into this whole multi-universe and trying well that trying to legitimize that is, or explain so, his lack of origin so that's some, that's some of the theories that people have is that it could just mean three Jokers from different timelines like, yeah, forget course, about like, timelines. But, like I'm with you dude one world just, it's a character that you can yeah. rewrite they well, don't all have to coexist in the well, same there's universe there's also yeah there's a theory of the oh, the smiling man um what, is it the smiling man fuck i can't remember i haven't read this stuff in a while but it yeah it yeah. works because the joke it, it, it feeds into his own insanity yeah. the, the unreliable narrator but, the unreliable character who is this guy it makes his own villainy but he is own- also literally just the antithesis to batman and that he is batman like that's the thing like he's batman psychosis like that and that's why i love the i love this neil gaiman story because yeah. that's always been what the joker is it's just what a reflection does a like, superhero serve without a villain yeah and after a while, a villain isn't enough. You need a super villain. Yeah, but I mean, is the Joker is both, both Batman is, and Joker it, are superheroes. We can call them. That, would you? But would you put the super tag on them? I would, because I mean, how would you avoid it? I mean, you have to call them superheroes, but they are by far and away some of the most interesting superhero characters because there's not this Deus Ex Machina vibe that you can. Oh well, he's a superhero. He just has this power. Uh, oh, he can, can get away with that because it's a parallel universe. Oh no, it's, <laughs> he was a clone. Oh no, he was Earth Prime Joker. It was like it's okay, cheap but then writing. Do you like Hawkeye? Hawkeye, yeah, for the same reasons, I think he's a powerful character. I think he's just, you can do a lot with, um, in comparison to particularly with, uh, with Hawkeye, because he's a guy. Hawkeye and Black Widow, they're humans who exist. I would have liked Black Widow more if it wasn't for the Marvel universe, like the MCU. They're sideline characters for the fact that they don't have superhero powers. Yeah, but I don't. I just don't like Scarlett Johansson as a yeah, like a fan either. I like no, I like Scarlett Johansson in like quite a few movies. I just don't like her as the Black Widow, and I'm glad she's dead. Uh, if you haven't watched the movie yet, sorry. Oops. Uh, <laughs> um, but to go back to the idea of superheroes dying and like how you're not emotionally invested. Well, in the, the cool thing too. is now with Endgame, some people died for real reals. 
And that really? is cool. Yes. Isn't there a phase four Marvel movie they're all going to come back in? Yes, obviously. But there's also actors who are getting old and have to, like, you know, bail on characters. Yeah, so so that's what's cool now is the the comic books are having to, well, not the comic books, the comic book movies are having to, like, you know, abide by reality. Because you can write the same character, like, Marvel time is what, like, one year is like seven years kind of shit? Didn't like, the new one take place five years after or something? What? The end game takes place five years after Oh, yeah, it did, but VR. no, just what I mean, like, in, so in terms of comic books, like, Marvel time is, like, it's always happening in real time, but, like, the characters don't necessarily age, and, like, so there's always, like, ah, uh, yeah, I'm getting confused by stuff I've read and seen and over time. There's, uh, um, why, there's a really cool one, uh, Go back to Judge Dredd. Judge Dredd is a very unique character. Judge is one of your favorites. I love him. But he also, that character has aged in real time. He's one of the only characters, I think. Who Shit, has... so he must be what, like in his 50s now? He's in his, seven, in his 70s. Oh, how old was he when he started? Uh, oh, because well, it started in the in 70s. 1977. So in 20s he came up. plus 50, yeah. Say he was late teens when he was in the, Judge, the Justice Academy, but they've aged him in real time. So Judge Dredd right now was you know in his 70s have they, but they kept the same at, continuity they've kept the same continuity but they've Damn, worked it with these sci-fi angles um he's essentially he's mostly cyborg judge red has had his eyes replaced he's had like lung transplants yeah i haven't marks, read since the 90s so. <laughs> that he is less popular than uh say the avengers but um but still <laughs> they should make a movie because, about him because they, uh, they did the one movie that deserved a sequel didn't get it <laughs> but um but i've always found that fascinating a very unique choice for for uh, well i mean not just one writer because he's been written by many different people but it enables it i think it gives a lot of opportunities a lot of quite unique writing opportunities to have a character who is not perpetually 20 something spider-man or yeah i mean well, even and with they, tom and holland they're they, making him a slightly younger spider-man they have they've gone that, that back cool. to school like they've made him the schoolboy spider-man which is cool and I do like that. And it's like, like they really, like, they they never really made a good older Spider-Man. Like, as Peter got older, they always fucked it up. Yeah. And so that's why they kind of needed to always, like, have a young Spider-Man. Yeah, because... Also, his snappy one-liners wouldn't really work once he's... No, uh, but also, they just, they just went too far with, like, you know, they made him, his character, like, soap operatic, like, uh, very much so, like, at times. And so, that's what when i was younger like i mean i don't really read comics anymore i can't like act like you know i'm buying stuff all the time like every now and again i'll get like you know a fucking what's them call it what, what are they called again where you get like all 12 in one fucking book oh yeah i know yeah just get the, the volumes the bo- I don't, I don't yeah buy yeah paperbacks, but yeah like so. i read a lot, a lot of stuff like digitally and stuff but then if i dig it i'll go i'll, I'll find a copy i'll get it put it yeah but I, I don't spend anywhere near as much time but like yeah like I also s- that man it's durban they're hard to find they're, they're expensive as fuck as well like 50 over 50 around a comic yeah like, I mean, yeah and, and you can never get the proper continuity if you're going to see an a or something i will no, say i mean we did but we had, we've got a kapow we've yeah got like, quick punt kapow comics kensington square durban north durban's one and only exclusive comic book shop go to it check it out support there's it also you get anything th- you there want. is also that shop in westfall at westfall mall which like, one? Unseen. No, no. There's like an actual comic book shop there. I can't remember what they're called. Like Batcave. It. No, no. Neither of those two. Oh, I'm not familiar with this one. Yeah, yeah. Like we'll go. Cool. Like I can't remember what they're called, but like yeah, they're like this little comic book store, like little nerd shop, basically out at. Rad. My favorite. Where's for more? Store. Yeah, and so so Kapow's in Durban North. I think it is. Yeah, Kensington Kensington Square or Kensington. Okay. I thought I thought right they there. were also in Westfall. I haven't been there yet. Oh, cool. It's a little shop in the mall, but um, yeah, it's very cool, and it, it's it's so great to see. And the 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 owner Sean, he really wants local comics, so he's a big supporter of the stuff I do, and the three and a half other people in Durban who make independent comics. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they're, they're, we're out there, but. Uh, but yeah, um, superheroes, they're, they're cool. Uh, can I first say a few final points on this? Well, I mean, we can, we can talk about this for a while. Cool, because I have more to say. Yeah. Uh, superheroes are, they labor under the burden of a shared universe, particularly the movies. Um, yeah. And this is, was a new concept when it actually came out. There was no franchise that worked off this idea of the movies relating to each other. Okay, there was one, two, three sequels, same characters. I mean, but the, but the cartoons did that a lot. Yeah, but I almost consider the cartoons different. I mean, they're, they're different, but they're like they're, they're their own canon. 
they are closer to the actual comics. Yes. So they're closer to the comic book canon. But the yeah. idea that li- live actors, real di- like actual people are directing these movies on massive budgets have these, these uh, you have to work within the constraints of what happened in the last movie, what's happening in the next movie. You've got to do it in the same style. You've got yeah. to, and that's a prob. It's a nice idea in theory, linking all these up. But from a, a director's point of view, you can never get anything new. There were a couple that, uh, Thor Ragnarok was directed by a guy called Taika Waititi. I think everyone knows that. Okay. Well, but but there was something okay. new. There was something unique. Because yeah. that guy was coming from Flight of the Concord. Yeah, he's, he's, a not, he's not a Zack Snyder he guy. Was, he was in Endgame. He was in it? Yes. <laughs> well, maybe I'll watch it for him. Yeah, you won't recognize him. He's uh, a lava, like, um, demon oh, cool. thing from, shout out. from, from, uh, from uh, what's we call it, from Thor's home planet. But I feel uh, if they started giving the... Giving you know, offbeat directors like YTT, these roles to, to direct a superhero movie, some of these movies could be very interesting. I'd actually love to see a Tarantino directed superhero movie. The Punisher. Uh, Punisher, yeah, but but that by its very content, it suits him. You know? That's exactly why he was um, the first, like the first thing I thought of. Like Give David Lynch a superhero movie, man. What does that Star man. do with it? It might work. It might work. <laughs> yeah. No, no, even, yeah, anything. anything really. <laughs> um, I doubt it'll ever happen. But I, again, it goes back to the idea of using the framework and of superheroes and, and, and changing something up, changing up what we know, changing I mean, up the continuity, that's changing what's... the director, changing the style. That's what makes comic books fun, though. Like, that is, like, and, yeah. the, like, and I guess that is what's missing from the movies. And I do... Well, the, yeah, because I tend to follow not so much titles as writers and artists. I don't follow... I'll, if I see, if I see uh, you know, Alan Moore has written the Spider-Man comic, damn, I'm going to read that Spider-Man comic. <laughs> That's probably why you've read but so much Batman. But it's not like I will like... read every Spider-Man comic because he's Spider-Man. But it is also probably why you've read more Batman than like the other superheroes. Because yeah, definitely. Batman's had the best writers. Like, let's be honest. I wonder like, why that is. Because he's a character that's pretty easy to write. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Not. Like, not that he's easy to write, but that he's got a. Oh, he's got... Super... Yeah, okay. Well, oh, Superman's definitely the easy. But Superman's hard to write because he like Superman's got the opposite of the Aquaman effect. Like I enjoyed early Aquaman. I enjoyed like uh, Zero Hour Aquaman like quite a lot. Like because he was going through like so much conflict. Like I like hated like the second reboot. Like where he was just like a normal ass character. Like people give Aquaman a lot of grief. Well, but, they did before the movie. Or but, he went but through. He was actually one of the. He went tri- through a lot of grief. <laughs> and also, his trident was one of the few things that could hurt Superman, apart from Kryptonite. I mean, he was a badass. Yeah, until like his. So in the Zero Hour, he like. I think it was Manta, or oh, I haven't read them in a while. Uh, he got his hand like put in like a river full of uh, piranhas, and then yeah. like it got like eaten off. And then he got this harpoon like put on on his hand. Now and then that eventually it'd be cool. Yeah, dude. But then that, like that sucks. But his wife, and, yeah. But his I'll wife and issue. but his wife and kid were like in a, like another dimension, like and like oh, okay. no, like but like watching like this, but like being like you know put, like um mentally put against him and stuff like indoctrinated against him and like just like super like weird shit like his struggle like Aquaman's struggles were pretty fucking hectic when like he had to go through his shit and like yeah so that's the thing like Superman's got the exact opposite so everyone's like oh Aquaman must suck you can only talk to fish well then as writers what you've got to do is make his powers pretty irrelevant in the story and just tell good stories with the character like utilizing some like some of his things that's like okay you might not I don't know if you watch Game of Thrones, but that's what made Game. Of Game of that's what made. I enjoy it. That's what made it good. Yeah, like that was it. That's like it had the fantasy backdrop, but it wasn't a fantasy story. Now it's a fantasy story, like you know, with the dragons and shit like that. Now it's gone into the realm of fantasy. The politics has kind of mm-hmm. died down, mm-hmm. and I think that's what people are hating on it. Mm-hmm. Like, dude, I actually I couldn't have put it better myself. I think, and that's something character. The word you use the word character. I write my own work on the basis. The first foundation is character. Yeah. Um. If you figure out your characters, if you figure out their relationships to each other, to the world they're in, the dynamics of what they, what motivates them, the story falls into place. And to con- to use Game of Thrones as a metaphor, as a as an example, um, I think you're absolutely right. It's a character driven show. Fantasy, a lot of the time, is it's the same <laughs> stuff. How many elves can you ride? How many dragons can you ride? It's like it, it, it's it's popular because it's so accessible, but 
And that's key... why sci-fi is just so much better. Some, well, <laughs> so, yeah, sci-fi deals in ideas more than... No, more. I mean, I'm saying this as an opinion that I have. Oh, no, like, I agree with you. I agree. Like, well, but uh, uh, Game of Thrones is something that's... It started with a, a base of really strong and often morally ambiguous characters. That's another yeah. thing I like. Heroes and villains are very black and white. That's why I enjoy... It's unrealistic. Stories. Yeah. Um, but inherent to superheroes. Good guy, bad guy. But you hate uh, Deadpool and he's, you know... But Game of Thrones started on, a, on, a, on this base of really interesting characters and interesting relationships with each other. And some of them, I mean, Jamie Lannister. I mean, he's a, he's a sister-fucking child crippler in the first season but now he's I mean, a good he, guy we love him uh, i don't know did you watch the last episode no i haven't i'm one episode behind oh okay okay, just... okay, okay. <laughs> here i am spoiling end game but don't tell me anything about <laughs> oh, oh no i definitely wouldn't um but i yeah but i i think at this point it's it's almost it's reached a, reached a very con- constraining and bloated continuity where they have all these story elements they need to consider including a starbucks well they need to know. yeah they need to get to the end like that's yeah, the and problem that's what they, they, i mean they're, they're wrapping it up i feel the only way they can is that why you think that george r martin's probably taking so long to write the fucking books because he can't like figure out a satisfying like way to get to the end because you know the whole time like you know what's great about game of thrones like you know, as a show, it could have gone on for 20 fucking seasons and we would have watched it. Like, if it never had an ending, that would be the best, like, thing about it because it's, yeah. a, it's a soap opera, like, essentially. Yeah, like, it is. It's, it's a, a political... A, a, lot of, a lot of men with beards and swords and dragons. And, it's a political you know. soap opera, like, you know, like, at its core, just set under fantasy. And so that's why, like, I think, like, he is having a hard time because, like, once you come to the end of the story, you take away all the what's going to happen. And that's been the whole thing with Game of Thrones is what's going to happen? Because every time you're like, oh, this is going to happen, your favorite character fucking dies. Yeah. And now it's like... Oh. A Battle of Winterfell, in my opinion, by Game of Thrones standards, there weren't enough P characters. Bro, that's why everyone was upset. Like, everyone was like, like, why can't someone I care about die? Like, you hey, know... I like Jorah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it really? I did. I thought it was, you know. You just... I mean, Little Bear, like, that that was the one that I cared about. Like, that was, that's the moments I fucking cared about dying. Like, Jorah dying but, was irrelevant. Yeah, I, I did dig her, but but consider for a moment. She, she had she to was... step up because of him becoming what a slaver. What was her character slaver. arc? She were, she really, she just shouted at Jon Snow in meetings a lot. What else did she do? Her character arc was she had to take over the, the household, I can't remember what it was called, of Jorah Mormont because he started getting into shady stuff and like s- screwed over his family after his dad took the black and went to the, the uh, Night's Watch. Like hey, the, the Mormons, man, just never ending drama with them. Exactly. The dude no, sucks. But, but, no, I agree. I, lo- I, lo- I loved her character, but uh, the the I thought she should have been she... further explored. Oh, too. I, I mean, we all yeah. felt that death. And I did dig the way that her, her death was these two little, her death was an almost direct parallel with, Aya's scene at the end. Yeah. Two little girls finding something so massively bigger than so them. Massive, and they kill it almost in the yeah. same way. They grab, they lift it up, and they just... Yeah. I thought that was quite cool and quite deliberate. And yep. the, 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 small, the, small, the small beasts are the ones that count. Um, I did dig Liana Mormont. I thought she actually deserved more of an arc. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, a pretty glamorous end. Just to go back to what you were saying about George R. R. Martin continuing, f- finishing the books and stuff. What I was thinking about the other day is actually how does a, as a writer, how, because now the show has surpassed what he's written, how does he write the remaining books? Is he not watching the show? Because if he is from, if he's watching the show now, how does that not influence how he's writing? Is that how you like think? Like, well, I'm not do you sure. think you would be influenced? Like, what, what do you like, think? I mean, I've also as, thought about that. That doesn't often. Ha- it's not often but when something is, is, so, is, is option for TV show or whatever. Usually, it's a completed work. So, from what I've been told, is that he's told them what the ending is. So he's. But how is he writing his own books? Well, he, without watching. But the uh, thing is, like people that are you know, writing the show have written the show from his works. Yeah, I mean, I imagine it's so, easier to continue writing the show without him than it is for him mm, to continue writing the books without being influenced. No, but what I, mean, what I mean is, like, that, you know, it's the same story, like, and you're going to just tell it in different ways. Like, it's the same thing, like, that the show is done with the books. It's taken from them, but it's not the books. Mm. Like, like, I haven't read the books, but from what I know, 
the show is nowhere near fucking the books, like, in so many ways. Like, it follows the storyline a bit, like, but, you know, there's so much that's missing from yeah. the show that's in the books. And so I just think that regardless, like, the... Like, even if he had to write it as the TV... Like, he's watched the TV show yeah. and just wrote what he saw on the TV show, it would probably be a lot more fucking entertaining than the TV show for his, like, yeah. readership. Like, they would be like, wow, this is so original and different. And, like, meanwhile, it's exactly what he saw on TV, yeah. but because yeah. of, like, how he puts it and how he, like, you know, puts the dialogue. I, I like the books. I, I read the, the first few. They are... They're cool, if a little long-winded. That's um, the like issue he, I have with he it, man. Des- you, he describes the filigree on armor. It's on, like yeah, pages. yeah. It's on that but Tolkien again, that shit. Fantasy, it's on that man. Tolkien shit, dude. And like, that's not what I enjoy about fantasy. <laughs> like, yeah, more hound, more jousting. Yes, just like give me. Just, just a spin-off show about the hound, really. I'd, would be I'd like fantastic. To, or just that. the hound and Arya, like <laughs> them together. That like, as a buddy no, cop no, no, show. No, no, like the the, the, adve- the adventures of Hound and Tormund. Uh, I think there's a buddy comedy there, right there. We we had a season with Arya and the Hound. I want to see more of 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 Kiss. <laughs> That'll be called Kissed by Fire. <laughs> just like you. Take your fucking hand off me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like those two. And I, I'm wait, I'm waiting for the, 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 the Clegane Brothers matchup. That's really... Oh, that's what... Clegane Bowl is something we've all yeah, just been, like, yeah. waiting for. It's gonna, But that might be where they throw us a little surprise and have the hound die. I'll be pissed off. I'll be extremely pissed that's off. That's why I want... Like, you know how happy I'll be if they actually do it? If they finally fucking actually make me upset about something again? Like... Like, you'll be a little bit upset at the end of this episode when you go watch it. But, like, like it's more, like, emotionally heartbreaking than, like, fuck you for killing that character. Like, it's, yeah. Like, I miss I the days. I miss the days of, like... Like, that's the thing. I want Danny just to die. Like, I just want her to just, like... Because that would be so out of left field. I think da- Daenerys is unfortunately Amelia Clark is a poor actress in a cast. Oh, I disagree. I disagree there. I think she's actors. a fantastic actress. No, she's terrible. Have you seen? Did you see her in Terminator? She played Sarah Connor, which is oh, strange. I haven't seen her in Terminator, but I've seen her in both Game Lina, of Thrones. Both and Lina I think Heedy, she's very both Cersei good. and Daenerys played Sarah Connor in various Terminator franchises. Huh. Uh, just a bit of trivia, but no, I think Amelia Clark and her, her. What do What don't you like about her acting? She, well, firstly, she. I don't. She the embodies the role. Cool. No, but she doesn't. She throws her weight around. She bullies people. That's Daenerys. She, she she is. She makes decisions that she's constantly kept trying to be kept on the straight and narrow by her advisors, who are both good advisors that is and the good character. actors. No, it isn't the character. It is the, because she's books. constantly going towards madness. That's what they are. That's what yeah, they I are playing that. with I you get there. That. And I actually, I kind of hope for that because you can see it. You can see her father in her now, particularly now that she's been made aware of the fact that she there's a threat to her throne. Yeah. But um, but I just she gets this expression. It's the same expression. It's the expression. For lack of <laughs> lack of a better term, it's an expression. Um, Social justice warriors, and I, I, I use this in the derogatory sense of the term. There is a better sense of the term, but she gets this but kind that, of smirk on her face where she's just about to ignore everything anyone has suggested to her and fire her dragons at the people involved. So she's acting she's exactly that, how she's, she's meant to act. She's making you feel exactly how you're meant to feel, and you're a bad, and she's a bad actress. It's a matter of opinion. In this case, I just I just don't like her, and maybe it's because I've seen her in various roles, and she always just seems to be playing an incarnation of the same bitch okay. face. Lena Headey, on the other hand, oh, Cersei fantastic. Lannister, I love her, and she was also in the Dread movie. Actually, she played a villain in the Dread movie, uh, Mama Madrigal. Okay, no, she is remarkable, um, like... and she's a great actress, and she brings actually she's infused. Some of the characters I've written in my work, I've taken a, a, a departure point from Cersei Lannister. It's that like, moral ambiguity where you root for her, you hate her. You root for her, you hate her. Like, but in what work? I would, um, Stuff you're working on at the moment. Well, Because let's actually talk in, about your work again. It's uh, been about 20 minutes of uh, sh- superheroes in Game of Thrones. So. Uh, I've recently completed a series of comics on Shaka Zulu. Yeah. Um, which was the Is this first... not controversial as a white guy? Well, you can talk about that if you want. But a little bit of background, it's, it's, 
I was approached, uh, it was the first comic I've had published by an actual publisher, as in not me printing them and hawking them out my backpack. Yeah. Um, it was published by a company called Story Press Africa, which is a... They do quite a lot. Uh, this is the first publication. It's, okay. a, it's a, a new imprint from a South African media company and a, an American publisher. Okay. And they've created Story Press Africa. And the aim is to have stories, African stories written by Africans for a global audience. And it does, uh, it works off the, the hype around Afrofuturism, around the success of stuff like Black Panther, epic TV shows like Game of Thrones. This is exactly what I sort of keep in mind while writing it, how it's pitched and stuff. Um, and, uh, so, like, I was political. approached, the company was familiar with the work, my self-published work, uh, my comic book stuff. And I'd worked for the South African part, uh, the South African company on and off in a freelance capacity for some time. So they were like, we know you can do comics. You want to try this? And Shaga Zulu is not a character I would ordinarily have tackled because of the obvious cultural and political weight to him. But I did feel, uh, it's an opportunity I couldn't really pass up. And I felt confident enough in my own writing to to take on this character. And as I've said, I like to flip around genres. So I did sci-fi, I did horror, historical epic. Let's try it out. And uh, Shaga Rising, I I worked on it as writer and artists with. Uh, You've collaborated with a few people. I've seen from what. A, well, you had a researcher. And yeah, okay. there was a, a, a research. I did a research assistant uh, and. Uh, a professor, a shark and scholar, wrote yeah. a forward for for the book. Um, and Shark Rising, the first one came out beginning of twenty eighteen um, in America, and then it was released because they wanted to get traction with an, an American audience. It was aimed overseas first. They even made me do like American spelling and stuff, which <laughs> irritated me a little, to be honest. But uh, and then it was released in South Africa, and the South African responses were actually what I was really interested in because it got really good reviews. It was reviewed in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Journal of Books called it a groundbreaking graphic novel. Yeah, it's like it's now nominated for awards and stuff now. Yeah, and you're going a, overseas for yeah, it. Yeah, I'm going overseas next year. It's been nominated. It's won and the uh, the honor one of the honor books in the Children's Africana Book Awards at uh, the Smithsonian Museum next year. So I'll be attending that. It's pretty cool. I mean, I've heard of the Smithsonian. Like, uh, um, I. <laughs> I wasn't aware of the award, but I mean, it's it, again, these things are, this is all kind of surreal. Like yeah. not only are people reading my work now, they're actually giving me awards for it. But it's, it is a bit weird to be given an award in America for work produced about, you know, a South African. I'm interested to see, cause they're, I'm probably going to do some school visits but in the States how, as well. And chat, I want to see the response, but the response. But how's the South African response been? Well, yeah, exactly. That's the, that's what I really wanted to know. And it has been, it's been well reviewed. It's, um, people have, it's going to schools a lot of good feedback from schools from students and teachers it's in libraries so it's historically accurate um insofar as <laughs> the history we have of shaka is accurate okay like I said okay earlier, i get you there okay. like i said earlier there's a the mix of historical fact and mythology is something that always appeals to me and shaka is very unique as a character because he is well, even the history of him is mytholo uh, mythological yeah yeah um what from uh, what i understand shaka has the records we have of the guy are Predominantly uh, oral storytelling re records, which are inherently unreliable. There's a certain broken down telephone that comes, you know, generationally speaking. And these are yeah. generational histories. A lot of the recorded stuff by scholars comes from oral recollections of people who were not even born when he died. Yeah, I mean, this is literally like the Bible. And the second the second main source are the diaries and writings of the white settlers, guys like Henry Finn, Francis Farewell, guys who have been glamorized in, you remember that 80s TV show with Henry Mele, Shaka, Shaka yes, Zulu, yes, the yes, one yes, we yes. all watched in, in school. They were glamorized as the heroes. They were these pioneers, these explorers, and there was a distinctly colonial white guy perspective. But the research I did, the research, uh, the books, the, uh, you know, from, from contemporary shark and scholars who have compiled a lot of these diaries, a lot of these eyewitness accounts, a lot of these, you know, his descendants, um, those diaries from the, from Henry Finn, they were blatantly untrue. They served to glamorize the white guys. They served to, to get land. These settlers, they wanted land. Yeah. Henry Finn himself. When he la he didn't elegantly land on the shores of KwaZulu Natal, he was shipwrecked on the bluff, and he was 
a criminal on the run from armed robbery in Bathurst at the time. I mean, this sounds like most people on the bluff. Well, he started it all. <laughs> um, but and he, and he came in and he and he shocker kind of, well. Point being, the the historical records, while they are, are unreliable, they make for fantastic narrative opportunities. Um, so, so you while, use the mythology of it. I use the mythology, but I'm also very aware of the fact that there's a lot of a lot of politics attached to this character, a lot of history. So while I I try I don't approach it from a cultural point of view. I approached it from a creative point of view. I'm not I'm not going to I'm not Zulu. Uh so I'm not going to pretend to write it from the perspective of a Zulu person or even or a black person. I'm writing it from a creative perspective, from a creative point of view where I take characters as human beings as we all driven by the same base instincts, the same desires. The I mean, you emotions. do have your own biases and influences and we do. No matter what. But, but. I I I try to how I write Shaka is I, I took all the research I had. I took, there were, there were certain elements that the publishers wanted included certain characters, certain scenes. Um, but I was given a lot of creative license and I think the response has, I, I always say, listen, engage with the work. Don't engage with me, engage with the work. If you have a problem with, if you have a problem with the fact that I've written it for whatever reason, read it first and then let's talk. That's all but, I ask. But you criticize things without fucking, like, you know, reading them or watching them or listening okay, to them. Okay, you got me. All right, you got me there. Oh, we're back in superheroes. Okay. Okay, yes. But um, but that is, that's more sort of, that's more ham-fisted, man. No, I mean, I'm, I, I'm with you, though. But, like, because the sensitivity thing is, I just, involved. I did see some of that criticism leveled at you when you announced the project. Like, then has that criticism died down over time? Since Honestly, the there been... hasn't been as much as I thought there would be. If anything, because I've done certain, a couple of panels on the stuff. Like, I did a panel at FanCon. I did a panel at Comic-Con about on the release. And mostly of the book. about that. Uh, yeah. Because that's a bigger release at the moment, I guess. Well, about the book, not about, you know, who wrote it and why it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff. But there, there were, I expected more questions around the subject of, you know, white boy writing an African story. But... And if anything, I feel I was probably overly defensive about that fact. But people hey, getting seem... called out on Facebook is going to make you feel defensive, bro. <laughs> you know, I I, I enjoy writing also, the story. I enjoy it's also it's good story, it's good to be it's, aware uh, of those things, though. It is good to be to sensitive be. to it. And I haven't read Shaka Rising yet, so I can't give any criticisms. But like, it is cool that you at least are open to it. And I, I want to hear it. If there is it, I want to hear it. But I mean, let's discuss the book. Let's yeah. discuss where it's... Uh, and there was... I mean, the research was very detailed. It was very in-depth. Well, there were a lot of guys, a so, lot of people involved. The second one, I, I took on a lot of the research myself because there's a sequel. The, the The first one deals with his ascent has to the Has the second throne. one come out? It's coming out in October. So it'll be ready for Comic-Con. But it's completed. It's printed. It's just the, the publishers do pretty hard marketing for like six months. Yeah. Um, and if, in my opinion, the second one is even better. So we'll we'll see what this, but that leads up to his 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 ultimate assassination. Well, you, well, you wouldn't um, think that it was uh, worse. Every every book I write, every comic I create, I I feel I personally get better. Like I look back on early Nero, and I'm like, oh, that's yeah, such a flabby story. It's such terrible art. I can't stay on the line. I would but it's I would an say evolution. I would say with Sunday Slave. So as I said, I haven't read Chuck Rising, but like I did find the writing to be tighter. Yeah. Like, and yeah. definitely and shortening the story also if you can write a short story you can write a long story if you can and it's not necessarily the other way around uh so <laughs> i i try and i try and do that uh just uh, chakra rising also it was another thing it gave me an opportunity to work in color oh yeah i can never afford to do otherwise actually yeah like that is the big difference because um, yeah your own printed stuff nero is uh, suited black and white it was sort of gritty dystopian Whereas sunday noir. slave i would have liked it to be in color sunday slave i do want to do it in color i don't know if it's because i've i've done it after shaga rising and uh you've and, seen the yeah i can see i mean shaka could never have been done in black and white it needed that color sunday slave i have very distinct color schemes in mind and once i've completed then... the five issues i will compile it hard copy hard okay back. I was gonna say you're gonna publish like approach yeah, a publisher I'll do omnibus, like... um, but yeah, I just want to g- get it out there. For me, a lot, a lot of the time, it's the like I, I mean, I'm not. While it's great to get this sort of exposure with Shaga and um and this a reach I could never have achieved with my own so the stuff. You stuff. It's not, I'm not tell. making. I'm not making money out right. of this stuff yet. <laughs> I ain't rich, man. I ain't got dollars up. I got a royalty statement. Um. 
no royalties yet. I'm still working <laughs> off the advance I had, but um, hey, you got an advance. But the fact that people are, yeah, man, for for a while there, I was actually earning a modest paycheck to do comics month by month. I don't have to do anything else. That's pretty nice. What actually got you into writing comics? Like, I mean, obviously you grew up reading comics. And so you're just like, well, fuck it, I'm going to do this. Um, it was a combination of things, actually. Because uh, becoming a comic book artist in South Africa is not clever. Well, it's, it's not <laughs> the first thing that occurs to people, but we have a small community and it's growing. Yeah, there's a reason why it's small. But um, my there's, love there's of comics no started, I think, with... Because I, my mother and my, my grandmother read to me as a child they read yeah uh, my mom read, read a lot of fairy well. tales they read the grim fairy did you tales, get the Norse mythology greek oh, okay. the odyssey the iliad that kind of stuff oh wow so just like the heavy Everything. shit all of the, i mean a lot of someone was abridged or you know it, 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 i was very young yeah like the iliad like might have been a I, bit I didn't read the, I'm, I'm sure my mom was not reading me the original homer text but um <laughs> But those stories always, I, l- I love the epic nature of them. And, yeah. and if you evolve the thought, those stories, are, superheroes are what those things were. I mean, Shit, man. I can't Thor is even in the Marvel universe. Yeah, I, I can't remember who said it, but some people just said, oh, someone said like something about like, you know, all stories are just the Iliad. Like, I think they're all, they can all be compared to those. Certainly all epic stories can compare. Uh, I mean, there's another saying, there's, oh, there are only seven stories. Yeah. Or is it? Or is it two stories? A stranger comes to town or a man goes on a journey. Yes, that's yeah, one of the classic like things. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a cultivated a love of storytelling from a very early age and combined with a certain passion for art. Um, I always enjoyed drawing. When I was in preschool, the teachers actually called my mom in. They were like, we're a little concerned about what your son is drawing. I mean, oh, what you're drawing like fucked up shit. Monsters and things like crocodiles with chicken heads and stuff. I do <laughs> remember that one. And my mother, bless her heart, she just laughed. She's like, don't worry about my son. He's just got an imagination. He'll be fine. It sounds like my mom. Like, granted, I was, you know, graffitiing stuff. Oh, we turned out okay, huh? <laughs> uh, I mean, the, ju- the jury is still pretty much fucking out on that one, to be completely honest. But have not turned out as badly as people thought I would. So that's There's still that's, time. Uh, that's There's a win. still time. Oh, I mean, I, I'm less on the road to ruin than I ever have been. So, okay, that's a that's a sidelong compliment. Good to yourself. Go yeah. work on that. Man. <laughs> I'm less on the road to ruin than I ever have been before. That's hedging your bets. I like that. <laughs> uh, I, I like hedging um, my bets. I'm a gambling man. Yeah, and then it was, uh, and then after that, the the third, the third, the the. The pledge, the turn, the prestige. The third part of what got me into comics <laughs> was 2000 AD. It was my dad bringing home. You remember the Kilo Bookshop? Yes. 2000 That's AD. That's why comics. I've got a cupboard full of comics. That's like. where, because you could never get. Like you said, I mean, stuff. If if you got any sort of chronology at CNA, they cost like a hundred bucks each. Kilo Although Bookshop there was in, that beautiful period where CNA had bought out like that Italian company. And the, the fifty like, cent bin. Yeah, I, I got some good. It was good five rand, but yeah. <laughs> Um, but, and, and one of the first comics my father brought back was 2000 AD, uh, and stuff, which I didn't, I'd never seen in CNA and I read and knowing comics you, and like, was, that's just the most you comic book it ever. It was so, because I was familiar, I'd read superhero stuff, but it was almost this antithesis to, to what, to the, the kind of, you like image line. comics, obviously. Yeah. 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 But I mean, that only, that all that stuff came later, oh, DC yeah. Vertigo image, um, but 2080, Judge Red, I'd never seen anything like it. The violence, I'd never seen like. <laughs> Particularly the color issues. It's just like yeah. exit wounds all over the page. That Simon is, Bisley's art. That is what I enjoyed Same, about. Man. Like, I also had like a similar experience with uh, Judge Dredd. Like, 2080 was like very much. But I only got like, yeah, a few issues here and there. And just absolutely loved how like. Most of my collection actually came from the, the Kilo bookshop at that time. It was a period of about 10 years. Which yeah, between I, CNA and that place, like that's same my collection. Until yeah. I started going to Joburg and then I started hitting up comic book shops there. And then I started getting like actual really issues. Like, and, actual comic book shops? Yeah, like you can get, wait, this was released yesterday. It's here. Um, how <laughs> it's not from 10 years ago like what yeah, the fuck? i mean even even like the stuff i got it was there was a, chronology was not a huge issue i was just i mean because also oh, also just, 2080 was anthology stories so you could so actually everything was could in, read, yeah. cool um i do enjoy that and combined and also my my father also had a fantastic to this day has a fantastic collection of, of just pulp sci-fi 
Philip K. Dick, Robert Heinlein, those old paperbacks, those pulp covers and everything. So I read a lot of that stuff. And it got to a point where I was, all these things combined, and I realized Any that... Any Elrond uh, Hubbard there? Yeah, Elrond Hubbard. Um, like, I've, 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 I've seen a field Earth and Death Quest, man. Those I mean, were great But I mean, I wasn't aware the guy had started a religion at that point. Yeah, like, I keep but, seeing but his books that, in second-hand stores, and I kind of want to get them. No, I did I did try and reread Battlefield Earth. Is he and, any good at No, that? it's no. not good. <laughs> it's bad, dude. It's not good. It's, like, really... It's like the the Louis Lemur of of sci-fi. Okay, because you know, it's, it's this. It's who's Louis pulp. Lemur? Sorry. Oh, he was he was a, a, a cowboy writer, a western writer, but he okay. produced like pulp. dozens and dozens of cowboy books, just running off the same formula and the same. Oh, I hate to say this, it's starting to sound like superhero movies again. Um, but but no, no, it, it, they weren't. They, I really enjoyed them at the time, but uh, and and I, I do credit those books with getting getting me into storytelling and sci-fi as a genre but um a lot of the stuff has did not date it well yeah but I've, I've, always, realize... I've always been interested in picking it up just to see but i've never actually wanted to spend the 10 battlefield the Earth, it, at the point it was like that thick it was the biggest book i've okay. ever seen it was like, 1, no, no, no one can no one can pages. see like how thick you are oh yeah sorry <laughs> <laughs> you're trying <laughs> to show yes. the mic again <laughs> Rather, like it's about I'm the size sorry. of two dudes. I mean, books. they've missed all my facial expressions and gestures. Yeah, unfortunately, people have asked if I want to put this on video, and I don't because no, I don't. think it's a terrible idea. No, because I also think like when you've got a video, you perform way more. Like with microphones, you're already still performing a little bit for the yeah. audience. Whereas, like I think with video, there's no po- chance. Like you can't have an honest conversation. Yeah, because you're conscious of it. Yeah, entirely. Uh, so yeah, you so you just you read well, yeah, 2080, it was, and, and, and then it was a point. I got to a point where I realized that that actually this is what I wanted to do. I wanted, I mean, when I was in high school, in, in prim- even in primary school, and then like as I started considering what I might do for a living, I wanted to draw. But, and but, comic books but, gave me the idea that if this is the best combination. But what made you think you could do that of, for a living here? Like, well, cause to like to be honest with you, like that to me sounds insane to think like in South Africa that I you could make money did. drawing comic I books. I never did, and I still don't. Honestly, I mean, I still I work as a freelance illustrator. I yeah. have a degree in graphic design. I hate, there's nothing more than I hate more than designing logos. But I'm trained to do it. I have four years in the subject. But I did know that. I think I was tangentially aware of the fact that this wasn't something that could make me a lot of money. So, but, but illustration potentially was, so that's where I angled my efforts. Okay. I was always interested in comics and I did realize that if I ever wanted to tell stories, this would be the medium I wanted to do it. Pictures and words. It's more than a thousand words. It's the best medium of storytelling. I also feel that comic book writers or more specifically uh, comic book creators, someone who can do, who can do the art and do the writing. Because it's rare. They are a lot more equipped to go to branch outwards into like someone well, who yeah, is solely you, you can now write a story or you can draw it. Like, yeah. You also, you have an understanding of the, the dynamic between uh, word text and image between words and, and framing and cinematography. I think of my comics cinematically like light sources, camera angles. I think someone who can write, and I can, draw a comic I can definitely can see that in some sleep actually. can write a script, can do a novel. Whereas the reverse is not well, necessarily true. A novelist, a novelist not necessarily make a movie or no, write a comic. A, no, a novelist couldn't, I mean, uh, a novelist could potentially write a comic, but to would then need to be rewritten. Like that's like that. That was you like it would need to then take someone who's written then, a comic book before exactly, to then put it into exactly. like framing and like yeah. Um, exactly. There are comics are a language like any other language. I mean, like so the like, language but it's the same as like, like writing a play, literature. like versus it like is. writing. But a lot of people else, like, don't, still don't consider it. It's like uh, this perception, particularly like Hollywood, that every comic book writer is some frustrated screenwriter just wanting to get their stuff onto onto into oh uh, that was like mitch hedberg talking like when he was saying like you know every comedian wanting to like be in movies well, or yeah, it's yeah, the same, yeah it's the same mentality but it's 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 blatantly inaccurate it's there are very unique medium and it's not the it's not the art it's not the text it's not the frames it's not the gutters it's not the spaces between the pages it's everything working in combination as a language and it is not as simple as oh i want to make a comic i'll go here's a writer and you're an artist make it now it's you have to understand how comics work and i have had a lot of people over the years um come to me or or, you know i've met people um who are like i want to make a comic i'm a writer and stuff and i'm like cool well you know what's the idea what do you have in mind and i quickly realized that these people have not only never never read a comic and 
that is, I think, the most important misconception to disabuse is that comics are not they're not graphic novels. Graphic novels is not a term that means anything. <laughs> it is something that has come up by, was come up by some marketing. Well, it's a way to legitimize. No, like, it isn't. No, it is not. And I very strongly feel about this. No, like it's, that's the thing. It's a term to legitimize. Do you use call to movie, Do you call films moving pictures? Not anymore. Comics are not graphic novels. They have elements of graphics and, and elements of literature and novels, but they are a unique medium. Graphic novels is a term that has come up with by some marketing exec in a basement oh, to I sell more you. comic books. And it grates me every time I, I'm forced to use it to, Dude, to sell like my own comics. it's like sports entertainment. It's sports... <laughs> Sports entertainment. People, that's another thing. People don't understand wrestling, dude. They don't get it. They don't Actually, get it to the extent we do. Maybe not. But, but uh, comics you know what? Are, point, just to end that point, but, comics are the medium. So call it that. So what's the message? The message is whatever the hell you want. The message is something you could... It's the message, could, not the medium. No. <laughs> as long as you understand the difference between all these things. Um, it's just something I feel strongly about. But I, I see the hilarity of how successful comics have become... Ever since they were started calling graphic novels. Yeah. I mean... It's ridiculous, but it's true. Yeah, because then people feel more confident to buy it. Yeah, and you it's no longer, you can put it on... If it's it, a compiled volume with a hard cover, you can put it on a coffee table. You don't have to hide it in the cistern of your toilet. Exactly. And now, like, you got to thank fucking the Marvel... Like, the MCU. You have to thank them a little bit because you're selling comic books because of them. Yeah, yes and no. I do I do appreciate the fact that the MCU... The more Marvel people than universe, More people than ever care about comic books. Yes, more people than ever are convinced that comics are nothing more than superheroes, though. But that's and always been that. the case. I tried selling Shaka at Comic Con, people would come up to me and they'd be like, "So is this like Shaka as a superhero?" Yeah, but that's no, fucking. This is Shaka Zulu as a badass man, like he was. Yeah. So the problem is there. Like that's just you're going to now be put in touch with a lot more idiots and a lot more casual fans. Yeah, I know. Listen, and, but right. the thing I'm, is, I'm, I'm, casual I'm... fans can become hardcore fans. Exactly. Casual fans and can people become who like... come up. I mean, I enjoy engaging with these readers, these fans, people who would never otherwise have, have been even at this convention. But, oh, dude, I can definitely get that it's movies. frustrating like to get some stupid questions. Like as a comedian after shows, like, you How know you what? come up with your material? Bro, like sometimes I enjoy your presence. A lot of the time, <laughs> I do not. Like, not like as a diss to anyone listening to this right now, it's just a weird ass fucking situation when you're coming from an ignorant place and it's a thing I do a lot. Like, you know, so yeah. like, like you have awkward situations come up out of it. And I can imagine as a comic book artist, you must have the most awkward of situations, like with people coming up to you, like, well, my, <laughs> my, uh, my unpopular opinions on superheroes are actually <laughs> Started losing me sales, actually. I, I mean, really? I, I, well, I, you know, I, I bitch and moan, but as you can tell, I've spent some time doing it on this podcast. Yeah, yeah. But I it's, do it it's with a, a certain fun... edge of humor. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, whatever. They're fun. They're cool escapes. Fun. But, but like, I mean, I've said this to people, like, at, at Comic Cons, people have come up to me, you know, and I'm talking to them. I engage the audience. I engage, I engage people who come over to my table. But then, it's like, when I start even jokingly saying, or oh, this is the question, this is the irritating question I always get. Oh, Marvel or DC? Marvel or DC? And and I always I give a what big smile Image. and then I'm just like superheroes. Who cares? Uh, and and recently I've started noticing that it's actually people just they're like oh and then they don't buy anything and walk off. Yeah, so maybe change your tactic. Yeah, I know I have. I'm being very careful to. Do, I still do just don't watch the movies. I just make sure I read all the spoilers oh, so just, I can give reviews. When people without. say Marvel versus DC, you got to come with the hipster thing of being like Image or Vertigo or like just like say like yeah like a small town like thing. I'll just say I, I usually I, just I say usually never heard a of that character. I usually just I'm the Batman Joker thing. That's, yeah, that's my go-to because honestly, out of all all of the mainstream superhero characters, I think those are the. That's the far, uh, the, the most, what, some of the most nuanced characters. Are there any other mainstream cats you enjoy? Well, within the, the extended DC and you you Marvel are universe, you are a more DC guy than Marvel though. Uh, probably only because it's got Batman in it. Um, so dark. Dude, I don't. I, I not not even. I mean, I just go, I go back to to the like two thousand eighty universe or the or the. Uh, I mean. Stuff like John Constantine, like Hellblazer, like yeah. Preacher, which is still, so it's in DC Universe. Preacher's not the same continuity, but they have yeah. somehow shoehorned John Constantine into Justice League in the comics somehow. Have they? they did that. Uh. But, um, <laughs> but that kind of stuff. But again, John Constantine, Hellblazer, not a superhero. 
He's just a regular dude who knows some magic. I love that. I love these flawed human characters who get the shit kicked out of them physically. They're not imposing. They're not tough. But they... They're, I'm, I'm tapping my head. Uh, <laughs> in a sort of... You know, they're brainy. Um, they're smart. Yeah, and those kind of... Were you bullied at all? Nuanced uh, human characters. Um, but in mainstream superhero stuff, I couldn't give a shit. They're all the same. But were you ever bullied at all? Stuff. And like had to like out like what your... Not really. I was too weird no. to be bullied. I didn't have many <laughs> friends, but no one wanted to mess with me because I was just they, fucking weird. Were they worried you were going to shit up the school? Like... Oh, well, this was before like, Columbine and stuff, but yeah, I was—I would probably have been considered a candidate. I was a loner. I was isolated. See, I was My nose ran a lot, so oh. I had these, ironically, I had, <laughs> my grand bought me these superhero hanky jokes. I had Batman, I had Superman, I had Spider-Man. It was one of the most And they were always coming to your rescue. Well, it was, it was strange because this was preschool. I don't know why this memory is so visit, vivid, actually, but I remember those superhero hanky jokes because I had such bad hay fever. And I was always snotty faced. And this one kid, this kid used to, he'd come to me because I'd sit by myself by the jungle gym or whatever, away from everyone. I'd just watch. <laughs> Weird in itself. And this kid would come to me and he would just give me, st- give me shit. I, you know, I can't remember anything physical ever happening, but you know, it just made me uncomfortable. And one time he stole my hankies, which in retrospect was so strange because they were full of snot. Yeah. They were really gross. So why would you want to steal my hankies? Bullies are weird, man. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, and that was preschool. And later on, I was just, I kept to myself. I was weird. They called me Casper. So, cause I was so pale. So, okay. I can, I can um, imagine that. Oh, thanks. Um, but no, dude, I got called really... Casper at times. Like, what are you talking about? That was my nickname. No, it wasn't a nickname. It was just an insult to me. Like, it wasn't. Oh, hang like... on, maybe mine was an insult too. Then <laughs> that never even occurred to me. <laughs> like people would just like when I was in the change rooms, like take off my shirt. Like if I took off my shirt, just be like, "Oh, what up, Casper?" Like just as a throwaway line. Like, I'm sorry, it was your identity. Where's the badge? Of, badge of honor, man. Badge of honor. Casper's a tank as well as a friendly ghost. I might add. Uh... <laughs> But uh, yeah, nah, never bullied. He's also a rapper. Oh yeah, Casper, from what I've heard, no vest. you were also a rapper. I still am a rapper. Are oh, you still a rapper? Well, the <laughs> the sippers don't die. We just multiply. Like... We we are on extended hiatus. Kenneth. Uh, okay, yeah. Let's talk. Our... So, what are the stuff? Like, no one, no one listening the, now knows the sippers. The sippers well. were a, a, a rap crew, uh, not a hip hop act. A rap crew that I was part of back uh, in. What is it, 2000, mid-2000s, I guess? Um, with the surfers. With the surfers, it was a, it was a so joke it was act. This was brain, before oh. the popularity of stuff like the Antwoord, but we were doing stuff like that before they got famous, I'm telling you. Um, we never took it seriously enough, and we never had any sort of marketing organizational skills to punt ourselves. But so you weren't very good. Well, I think we were a, a lot a lot better than people gave us credit for, but a lot worse than we thought we were. I would 100% agree with that. <laughs> that is a very astute observation. Um, yeah, no, we weren't, we weren't as clever as, as we thought. And to the point that we did, like, I think... Oh, the arrogance one of youth, two, two and a half live acts, two and a half live shows... Oh, you actually Winst- performed? At the Winston. They were bad. Did anyone show really up? Really bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> um, but it was... No, they were so bad. I mean, this, I think one of them, we were, we were so nervous and... Alla, there were three and, of us and yeah because you guys me. were also just rapping about the most absurd fucked up shit well we all had very distinct styles that was the thing that was the, the problem too but it was, it was <laughs> me it was this guy uh, apathetic I'll, I'll give us I'll give the rap name so so I don't, I don't name and shame anyone apathetic and point five um, point <laughs> five was the, the only le- man you already of color did, you already did legitimizing this rap crew you already did drop both their names but it's cool oh well <laughs> you'll bleep <laughs> that out right maybe <laughs> um, and we it was just a, a laugh. It was just a joke. We got together and we had a we we, we split for a, a shitty hundred rand microphone, which we subsequently had to put a sock over anyway. Um, <laughs> and we were just listening to stuff like Necro, Jedi mind tricks, old school. Wu-Tang yeah, the neck the Necro definitely the came was through. Very evident. And and we just jacked beats. We didn't make any of our own beats. I think we made one of we, we got a beat from from Loopy. Bless her heart. A one <laughs> original beat came from Loopy. And it was the the song was called DJ Creepy Steve. Shout outs. <laughs> um, and then we yeah, but we just jacked beats off the internet, um, mastered them in a, a, a shitty uh, demo version of Acid Music, 
Um, and that went on. We produced, we did two and a half live shows, if that. We produced about so five why, albums. Why half a live show? What happened? Um, we forgot our lines. Alistair took his shirt off and just started going like, just behind the speaker, rapping from behind the speaker. Kenneth just sat down and started reading his lyrics off the off his cell phone. It was bad. But we, we leaned into it. What you're going to do? <laughs> um, oh, that sounds amazing. We released five albums, which are online. <laughs> Reverb Nation, if you want to search Siphos, they're all there. Some of it has really not dated well. So if you're a f- easily offended or offended by anything at all, really probably don't listen to it um yeah well some of our members have faded into obscurity uh some and some of them are trying actively to distance themselves <laughs> from what what we were because they have legitimate careers and family now but me hey i'm still fine i said to the both of them i said to those two assholes back in fucking like 2005 this is gonna ruin your career you're gonna have careers and children one day and they're gonna find this shit on the internet so watch what you say did they listen to me no why um, do you feel like you're not gonna have kids or well also my lyrics, my lyrics hold up my verses oh hold is up. it you you they like, do i'm you're... confident in them <laughs> but again it was an outlet i mean jokes aside it was for me personally it was a laugh we had fun we got courts and it was just jaws you know yeah. we weren't even interested in girls at the time we just <laughs> we literally hung out in kenneth's bedroom and his mom would tell us to shut up sometimes but but uh, for me, it was as times. much a creative outlet as, no, dude, as that's my a... comics and my art were. I was talking, I was doing what I could, the stories I couldn't tell in, in pictures or in words, I was telling in verses. I mean, I that's was, the thing. Like, I, I, I never, I, I, like... Always, I love Nick Cave and Tom Waits and guys like that. But I always felt that required actual effort in making music. Whereas yeah. rap, I steal a beat, I got a microphone, just spit it out. Yeah, I could kind of hear that that's what you guys were doing, though. So that's Paper why it wasn't great. Was big yeah, but, but yeah, it was fun. Like, it was never meant to The Sifos was never worth the second listen. I'll say that much. Like, the first listen but was fun. But you gave the first listen. Yeah, the first listen was always fun. And, like, you know, yeah. like, I'd laugh a little. I'd be like, oh, or whatever. But what do you think of SJWs? Like you were saying earlier, there's, like, a positive and a negative to it. Because oh, oh, no. you've caught I the, the heat of some people uh, who are a bit too far on the left. And you've also... I? Like you know, like people called you out for being white, like you know, in writing shocker oh, yeah. and stuff I mean, like yeah. that. And like, I mean, those are the, yeah, and like in general, knee jerk responses. And also people. the stuff like you know, with sophos and stuff, you had people like giving you guys shit about it. Like yeah, probably the rightfully so. There was that it was never serious. I mean, some yeah. of it now it's like it's kind of cringeworthy. Mostly the other guys' verses, but <laughs> um, but that was never. It was never. It, it was never meant to be serious. It really wasn't. And I always felt like people could tell that by listening yeah. to it. We never pretended to. We pretended to be gangsters, but we also pretended to be cannibals, <laughs> you know, and aliens. So, I mean, the, the context is important. Listen to, transcribe the lyrics carefully and listen, know what you're hearing. So do you, you, make do you think that like, that's the problem at the moment, I guess, with culture is like lack of context or like, do you think people intentionally just ignore the context of stuff to get mad about it? I think that uh, yes, sometimes I think it's it, you can't generalize on any of these no these, obviously these issues, not. but I think that is a problem. I think SJW itself has just become a, it's a, a shitty term, term a ban- like, but it's become almost like it, 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 it's it, the hipster it's become derogatory, like, it, but it's well, not yeah. meant to be. I mean, it's social justice warrior. Those words mean good things. Yeah. those should be ideal you should be worried about social justice you know blame the internet blame the trolls well i mean the The word incel was coined by a woman and now it is used to describe some of the most horrific misogynists on the internet yeah oh Um, wow i didn't realize that involuntary celibate no i know what it means and like i use it to describe but i guess we all do that we all other the opponents of the opposition and we find terminology to like Mm. other them with and like using stuff, you know, it's like SJW and, and, and incel and is very much co-opting, you know, words and their own words essentially. Yeah, like, is, is a very insidious and unfortunately often very effective way of of maligning a cause or a person or a, or a topic. I mean, I do that to <laughs> the right all the time. So, like, I do. You yes, but when it's in the name of a good cause. Oh no! Like for me, it's just entertainment. Like, like I'm just gonna make fun of you on my timeline, like on Twitter and stuff. If you have ridiculous ideas, like, fuck you. <laughs> like, good, but that is, I mean, but that is what it should be. That is what. Uh, no, but like, what... I do worry that, like, you know, you are also just as long as you're ruining awake. people's days for like. But at the same time, like, people have just 
say the most whack, insane shit and you let go, how are you really saying this? Like, how is this an opinion that you're putting out in public? Like, well, the thing is, that, and this this is the this is the the curse of technology, Twitter and stuff, is the fact that these people always held opinions, but now they have an afor- they have forums. Yeah, to but shout like, them at the world. But the thing is, like, an opinion but is. But we now... used to do these things, like even on the internet, in private. Like you fucking say your whack ass shit on a stupid forum for it. Like, you know, on your fucking Nazis 101 fucking <laughs> forum, go talk your Nazi shit. Don't bring it to public discourse. You're meant to be fucking hiding that shit. You and know? now everyone's also meant to respect this stuff. Oh, it's just a matter of opinion. Oh, it's just my opinion. I'm just pretending to be a Nazi. If you're pretending to be a Nazi, you are one. Then I'm just going to pretend to punch you in the face. Yeah, it's going to feel, it's, just, it's going to feel, it's going to feel, it's going to feel, it's going to feel a lot like a real punch. Like, you know, just like you look a lot like a real Nazi, but they're neither of these things are like actually true. <laughs> I think technology is, it has a, a great deal to do with, well, everything for politics, culture, the, 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 the acceleration of, of stuff. I mean, like it always has there, but like it, that's... but at an exponential rate now more than ever. Yeah. Because technology is... is like increased exponentially and it's connected us exponentially, but technology has always been the catalyst, like for, you know, societal change. Like, mm. I mean, you know, the internet, TV, phones, but then before that, the printing press, you know, before that, like any sort of technology, lighting, like, you know, candles going to a lamp, you know, like all these subtle like changes in technology have all produced different things that, you know, humans in adapt to. And at the moment, we are in a phase that we are so overwhelmed by stuff. Mm. We've never been this overwhelmed, I think. Yeah. Like we've never had this much information. We've never had this much stimulation like as a species yeah. like we i don't know necessarily if we've evolved to our technology yet but who knows well george orwell back in the day in 19, 1984 so he was his concern was that we would ultimately we would live in a society where information was so restricted and so confined and so sensitive that's the that exact opposite would, yeah. that we would uh we'd, we'd live in this big brother state but there was another guy aldous huxley who wrote yeah. brave new world who did say the opposite it's over there somewhere on the shelf yeah good books <laughs> um and he was like we're going to live in a culture of triviality yeah where mass media is so in your face all over the place we can kardashians concern us more than and we also constantly drugging Syria. ourselves you know like everything is excellent accessible and it's also yeah i mean just the i mean yeah brave new world i read it last year again and it definitely has some correlations to our current society in a I scary mean, way to go back to, to so sci- does 1984 sci-fi, sci-fi oh, sci-fi, dune. fantasy i think sci-fi is everyone's going back to dune at the moment which is kind of crazy like well it's probably because they're making the movie no you know, before that though like you know like they're making the movie because there's been well, interest i mean the the thing about dune is the a large basis of its, of yeah, its mythology it is. is the butlerian jihad this this thing that happened ten thousand years before the events of the first book which te- outlawed thinking machines essentially computers that's why you don't there's no computers Although Dune is a sci-fi, it's very unique in the fact that it's not. It's actually, very religious, see, like actually, you know, like it's, it's very mythological, like, mythological, and uses mythological. And mythological. a lot of that is very. But it's also very, te- but it's also very technological. Like, um, if you look at like the uh, still suits and stuff like that, yeah. like, and so those th- that culture is defined by the technology that it can produce and its environment. Like even got stuff to say on climate change. Now, that's why. That's why I think Dune is becoming so apparent to people again is because of how it deals essentially with climate. Mm. And it also deals with uh, religious fervor and, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah, right wing stuff, essentially, like nationalism and like lots of different weird, like... And I think it's also now in today's day and age, um, it's worth considering going into the new movie and even rereading the books, considering the, the Paul Atreides as the white savior, yep. which is something that, I mean, is more... Well, that's what the Ben Gazette's like... You know, for ages, but in today's in 2019, we're more we're, we're woke. We yeah. understand these things, and this also so they comes could actually, to like a, so, separating art and artist and art and all, you know, and all that. But I, I mean, I he does become the, the bad guy. Like he does eventually. But I think oh, sorry, spoiler are, are, alerts for people who haven't read like further into the hey, thing you, than the you first die, book. You either but, die the hero, or you were, or you live long enough. <laughs> to, you know. Yeah. Um. But he was always kind of the villain because the Bengusuits were always there to like 
you know, they were manipulating to save themselves, essentially, yeah. like him and his mom. Like, you know, but the idea that, like, the, in the Bene Gesserit had actually, because the whole okay. prophecy thing is, you've, you know, you've read Dune. Yes. The, the, the whole prophecy right. of this, of this, uh, they know, said the, it the, there. They set it up. Yeah. That's the in, longest con. In multiple planets set, everywhere yeah. so that they can utilize so the it for themselves. Thing, I mean, that itself subverts this, the white savior trope. That he was never, it was just all set up. Yeah. It was a big, long con. But it worked, you know, things happened ultimately. But then obviously the series spans like tens of thousands of years and stuff. Um, but I think even like sci-fi is eternally relevant. Books yep. like Dude, not only because it's only been remade or, you know, the new yeah, no, out, just the it's principle. because the, the ideas are, e are eternal or cyclical. Yep. Um, and I think cyberpunk is the reality we live in now but even stuff like more esoteric stuff like yeah. dune is still applicable to the world of today you know the invasion think of foreign spaces cyberpunk didn't of... know that it would be this boring <laughs> like cyberpunk is uh, i've always loved it because it has been that um it's it's almost been something that's on the cusp we're always on the cusp of it the yeah. 80s were a heyday of yes cyberpunk. very much um but that was all that sort of dirty chrome kind of bottom feeling and in the cyberpunk. 90s you had like hackers yeah like, and then now we've got like the ai and the, it's more sleek and chrome and yeah, Elon yeah, Musk yeah. cyberpunk um but there was something and there was a, a guy called william gibson a great cyberpunk author he wrote neuromancer one of the okay. one of the seminal cyberpunk works in the early 80s he um, he said um so he he doesn't particularly although he writes about technology accelerating as it is and this guy also coined a lot of terms um that are used today that are a lot of the iconography and semi okay, i think i know internet, about him, yeah. the information age he was one of the yeah. first people to use these terms but he said he's not so much interested in the technology he's interested in the way people behave around it yeah what technology makes people do not not so much what it makes us into not like talking about okay we're cyborgs now we've got implants well, but i mean but how that... it changes our perception of the world around us we can see that now like the idea of a constant but that's what body dysmorphia like stuff has always um, kind of been about yeah. like well, yeah. well not well not body body dysmorphia it is body dysmorphia right no body horror essentially like well, yeah. like there's a lot of like that like you know that conflict with technology essentially and like you know yeah the the symbiosis or lack thereof between man and machine and uh you know neural nets and and, and ai and but a lot of that and, stuff is i mean i love those topics like i do like and those topics are universal and they have been around since fucking plato you know yeah. <laughs> like essentially like but i think i think that's why sci-fi is uh, i've always gone more for sci-fi as a genre than fantasy because fantasy is fun but i've always felt found it, found it quite limiting in, in in relation to our own world yeah there's only unless you're doing specifically urban fantasy i'm throwing elves into new york city kind of thing or whatever which there is a lot of urban fantasy yeah but sci-fi is far more subtle ways of commenting so i'm just bored of fucking society. elves dog like fuck elves goblins where it's at <laughs> like, oh, man, so goblins kobolds the little the little shit creatures you know the the, the messy ones the anti-heroes that's what exactly you. um Sci-fi is, uh, it, it works. And that would, so to go back to 2080 again, just briefly, <laughs> um, 2080 came out in 1977. It's, uh, unashamedly started unashamedly sci-fi comic, sci-fi anthology. Yeah. But before that, the creators of 2080, a guy called Pat Mills, um, British guy, he was running, a another comic called battle, I think it was battle or valiant or something, um, with much the same sort of stuff. But uh, kind of you know, violence, boys' own war stories and stuff. But a lot of it, parents were looking at this. Government was looking at this. This was just after the 50s purge of comic books. Oh, uh, yeah. Seduction it's when the comic book code came in. And like, yeah. Delinquency. Britain escaped that a bit. But still, you know, parents were concerned. Yeah, but Swamp Thing like, was British, no. Uh, no, Swamp Thing was uh, DC. But... Uh, it was Alan Moore who reinvigorated that title. Okay, because he was okay. a British writer. Yeah, okay, okay cool, cool. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, 2018, just before it came out, this, this battle comic that it was shut down. Uh, parental like outrage and, and censorship. And they were like, no, no, it's not good for the kids. Stop it. So Pat Mills was like, okay, fine. And he just started this thing called 2018. Um, and he started telling some very similar stories um, about the world around. You know, the Cold War was going on at that point. 
and people were reading it and and he was asked in an interview like well this is kind of anti-authoritarian violent stuff how are you getting away with it and pat mills is just like well we're calling it science fiction <laughs> it's not the russians it's the volgans I and mean, but it was so 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 thinly veiled metaphors for the real world. That's like the Mortal Kombat no Eleven at the up. moment. <laughs> like it's a like yeah, like the bad guy. Like there's so much stuff like that's like corollary with like Trump. <laughs> like literally like using and same you don't even stuff. Have to, I mean, sometimes particularly with someone <laughs> with with characters, and I make no mistake, that's what they are. Characters like Trump, they're almost caricatures. Yeah. It's like comedy and satire is at a strange point um because the world itself is so like how weird. do you parody trump how do you do it like how, I can't, like, how do you parody I can't a parody i have to check you know tag the bylines is this an onion article is this like that dude that is 100 percent where we are at like there are many times like my american friends share articles and i am a laugh yeah. like i'm just like ah. and, and then like, oh, i see on. oh washington post and i'm like <laughs> but that's a joke right like but that's uh, why sci-fi is ever relevant man um and it yeah it doesn't even have to be you know cyborgs robots and aliens this is sci-fi it's around us it's happening and that's that's why elves in new york nah, but what about me. what about elves with the technology well like, there was, in new york there, there, there was like, there's a cool rpg game called no. shadow run which dealt with exactly that it was like Cool, cyberpunk, and let's add the Lord of the Rings crowd too. So it's like you've got orcs with these cybernetic arms and magic users. With yeah, I fuck with that. Eyes and it was cool, man. We played it back in the day. Uh, I can um, fuck with that. Um, so at the moment, though, you're doing so like noir, swamp noir, essentially. Swamp noir, yes. That's a that's a term I coined specifically for Sunday Slave. Um, because I wanted that sort of, uh, that deep, I've never been to the American Deep South or New Orleans, but I'm, again, fascinated by the mythology of places like that. Of yeah. The sort of that's... idea of Route 66 and uh, the French Quarter of New Orleans, the, the voodoo and the hoodoo. And yeah, the... I mean, that's what I enjoyed about Sunday Slave, like the first copy. I haven't read the second one. You just give it to me now. But like, yeah, that's because I love that shit too. <laughs> like, I'm such, a, like, I love, like, just, yeah, that's, mm. yeah, that Deep South, like, kind of, yeah. like, the, but the, you know, the Gators and, like, yeah. you know, like, yeah. the, yeah. the, the French meets, like, what's a the Cajun? Cajun. Yeah. Yes, like, that whole vibe. Like, I love just With Sunday that. Slave, I've also, I mean, granted, while I, you got I a am, little bit of that in there. Yeah, yeah. I'm very careful. I don't, Again, I'm, I'm aware of when I'm writing about stuff that actually does exist in the real world. I, I'm aware of it. But I you're not comfort. actually Rob, writing on Robert Johnson. That's why I actually... No, I'm not. I'm not writing. It's based... It's clearly based on his myth if you're f familiar with the guy. Well, it opens with but that also, idea. None idea, of the but places... You... None of the towns are real. No. I make them up. Um, it's sort of the this, this similar but... but I don't want to use... After, after shitting on it, I don't want to use the term parallel universe. But... Yeah. Um, but it is kind of a recognizable world, but not the, yep. not the one we know. And I've used, uh, I've tried to uh, use the, la the language because I feel language, it's very easy when you're writing comic books, particularly to just all your characters sound the same. They all yeah. speak the same way. It's just throwing stuff into. So you levels. had, cam you, you had actors actually the, speak yeah, French, yeah. characters speaking French. You don't right? get the nuance of cinema where you've actually got voices. But it also it wasn't like proper French. It was. It was the, Cajun French. Yeah. I did a lot of research on it. It was Creole sort of uh, pi pigeon. Because that was the thing. Like, I don't know a lot of French, but I know enough to recognize that that I wasn't was, exactly like. I was the, very specific. Anything you see in that comic, you can look up. If you put any of those words those into word, Google, they will, yeah. they will find it. Well, yeah. Like, but I was also careful to if you don't have to you could get what's going on exactly like that was the thing I knew what was going yeah. on like which was really dope about it like um, but I like doing that because I feel it does add an extra element to one's writing um, and particularly with comics which are a silent medium um, and Sunday Slave where I'm trying to actually pay homage homage to um, music the blues which yeah. is obviously has sound um, but in the comics I use, I, I, I quote certain blues lyrics and I just yeah. try and, I try to, Sunday Slave particularly, yeah, uh, to create the atmosphere that I feel when I listen to blues, because there's, I've found no other I can genre get that. of music that actually has so much. It's that with Preacher throwing it. <laughs> like... Yeah. It's got it's it's got it's got the horror and this, the 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 roly puffing and the hard drinking of Preacher and but yeah that Preacher was also one of the first DC Vertigo comics I read. Like it definitely does um, feel to me like almost like 
no, no, I don't mean this as like an insult, but like your own your own preacher comic. Like Thank like you. if you were writing it, like if you wrote preacher, like you would have written something like this, and like that's what comes like. And so that's the thing. Thank I can you. I can yes. tell like you read preacher. Like I can tell that, but it's definitely not like like preacher in that like it reads the same or anything like that. It's just clearly influenced but at the same time it's its own thing and i really did like enjoy like your take on things and i enjoy you you leave the the end of the first comic on a bit of a cliffhanger mm, because yes. how you open it you're giving a different like perception yes. of who sunday is because you're saying sunday is going there for a deal yes and then at the end but who's making the deal at the end, yeah, is Sunday making the deal with someone else, or is someone making the deal with Sunday? You'll see, yeah, like well, so. You'll see, you'll see in the in the second one I, that I flip around in timelines a bit, which is another thing. <laughs> you just hate it on board, like no, no, no. I mean, like, no, not uh, timelines, as okay. in like like I go <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, and but stuff like you uh, put yourself in a different. I yeah. really dig shows like True Detective. Um, yeah, and this obviously has that that feel it, to it yeah, too. Yeah, it also like that very much exactly. is in there. Um, but the way, particularly season, season one of True Detective, you haven't watched it, go watch that show. It's very good um the way they do is three separate the same story is taking place over a period of 25 years and three different time time area time periods and i do that to an extent with sunday's slave like i do a couple of pages in each issue you'll see in the new one of that crossroads meeting okay and you get a little bit more about what's happening and i've i i think that's if done pr effectively that's a very cool way of telling a story and yeah. something that one is seeing a lot more in, in cinema and TV shows. TV shows particularly, I feel, are going through a bit of a renaissance. Another it. thing that does that is uh, there was a horror show called Last House on the... I've Last heard House about it, yeah. I think it's called that. Yeah, it is. Or, or no, The Haunting of Hill House. That's oh, that's one. very different. No, no, yeah. no oh, The Haunting of Hill House. It's a, it's a Netflix show. I think it's Netflix. But it also deals with... It takes a very standard trope. It's a haunted house idea. We've heard this idea a million times. We've seen a million movies on this. But to refer to what we were talking about earlier character it deals with a very specific and very in-depth family of characters who are very nuanced very the, i mean the the depth of those characters and the performances are, are, are great speaking of which umbrella academy haven't watched it yet i think um, you'll like it but isn't that just like superhero harry potter no okay it's I make these sweeping judgments on things from seeing half a trailer yeah it's based on the comic by the guy from chemical romance yeah by gerard way it's like the X, like it's the X Men, but depressed. Okay. Like well, you know how you know my opinions on these matters. Do you think I would enjoy it? Yes, because I think you I, would really go, like. I'm I think you would really enjoy the recommendation. And if it's shit, no, I think you would really like the take on it. Um, because yeah, it's the superheroes, but it's yeah, like the reality. I'm putting that in inverted mm. commas. <coughs> um, but yeah, it's basically you know, the reality of these kids who grew up with superheroes and now okay. it's, you know, the post all of that and like their father dies and they come back together and like they're just, they're, they're a dysfunctional family. Okay. It's a dysfunctional, like imagine if the X-Men were a dysfunctional family. Like that's essentially it. Like, okay, cool. and the story is pretty cool. Like I think I like it. Like I enjoyed it a lot. Some people don't, but yeah, I really. Character driven stuff. Yes, that's what I th like. That's what I'm talking about. All right. I mean, it's also storyline driven. Like it is. No, well, obviously, but yeah. I mean, if you, as I said, if you if you work your if your characters are good and you're like, are you, did you? It watch doesn't always work the same the, the, the yeah. other way around. No, you can have a good story, but if your characters are two D, then then your story's gonna, gonna suck. Are. Did you watch Misfits at all? Yes. So the one dude from Misfits can't remember his name right now. The, the Brit British. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, the yeah, guy yeah. who was like. Uh, we were all so beautiful. Like you were, yeah, you're wearing yeah, yeah, cardigans. Yeah, okay. Can't remember his name. He's one of the characters. He's brilliant. Okay. Uh, what is his name? Edgar? No, is it? Fuck. Oh, British know. guy. He's yes. a British actor. I'm so annoyed. I can't remember his name right now. But yeah, so he's in it, and he's fantastic in it, and like, um, Umbrella Academy. Yeah. All right. Cool. You'll ch check out Umbrella Academy. I think you'll dig it. All right. Uh, Upon uh, your recommendation. Uh, you might not. I mean, you hate superheroes, so. Not one. Well, and no, no, but no. it's superheroes done I well because you know what you know what I actually I got you know what I got a feeling for this was a very Watchmen kind of vibe. Okay. Like a very Watchmeny kind of take on superheroes. Like these are real people. Like cool. so that's what I enjoyed about it. And you also obviously big Alamo fan. I am. 
and Watchmen, like the show is coming out soon. How are you feeling about it? Uh, have you seen the trailer? It actually looks kind of dope. It, it does. It are you does, worried? No. Well, the thing about because it's going to be a completely different story. No, but the thing and about the, comics, the thing about Watchmen, more specifically than anything else, is it does look cool. I watched the trailer, um, and I think there is quite a lot you can do with that universe. But you like to be self-contained. No, 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 no. It just leaves a bit of a bad taste in my mouth because Alan Moore himself was, for whatever reason, screwed out of a lot of rights in the 80s from, uh, from DC. Okay. DC really fucked that guy over. He probably wasn't the most easiest guy to work with. I mean, it's not like half of Marvel's people, but But yeah. he has disassociated. You'll notice any of the movies, V for Vendetta, From Hell, Watchmen, his name is not on any of those movies. He said, don't put my name on the shit you're making out of my work. Uh, and he has explicitly stated that he has he does not endorse, he does not condone, and he actively disagrees with anything made from his characters. Okay. Legally, he has no, he can't. He's do got anything. no rights to that. But the way that, particularly with this new Watchmen, oh, that's, show, that's frustrating the, the as way, a fan because I want to see very it. Very frustrating as a fan, particularly with the, sh- the new show where they keep going on. The showrunners, Damon Lindelof, who's a good, he's good. He knows television. He knows how to make a good show. But they keep going on about how they're going to honor the original work and the source material. And Alan Moore's comic was so great and so groundbreaking. But the guy, if you want to honor it, don't make it. The, it, the doesn't, is, it doesn't look so, like a, is, it's, it's remaking it, though. It no, looks no, no, like no, it's no, its own but, story. But it's like, his characters. It's his oh, universe. oh, so that's what Watchmen. you're saying. Watchmen yeah. was not a DC property. It was yeah. entirely Alan Moore. That they bought. And they like, weren't. And all those characters were his characters. And he, he has explicitly said he does not want this series to be made. So, okay, if you're going to fuck him with rights, do it and make your series. But stop saying that it's going to honor the original source material. And as you say, it is difficult because I am a fanboy. I didn't dislike the movie. And some parts I thought the movie was actually better. See, I don't know any of this. And yeah, I definitely thought the movie took a way better stance at the end. Yeah, the ending was, the ending I felt did work better. I agree. But, um, political, like it just made a better sense. It's a bad taste in one's mouth when you want to align. Yeah, you're telling me this definitely bums me out. Alan was saved. He was the first person, one of the first guys who saved DC. DC was flagging in the 80s. The comics code had crippled them. They were just trying to come out of it. They had no good writers. Yeah, I mean, and they, they were started, on like they a saw the stuff that twenty years. They saw the stuff that two thousand AD was doing because Alan Moore at the time was cutting his, his teeth in two thousand AD. Alan Moore, Grant Morrison, Warren Ellis, all these guys were. And all those three names. I mean, Warren Ellis is still like creating, creating dope shirts. Like, well, and, and a lot of they all yeah. went on to work for DC Vertigo. Yep. Yeah. Um, this was even before Vertigo came out. Um, they brought Alan Moore uh, around. Uh, and they gave him this title that no one liked. This title about some fucking plant guy in this he did swamp thing. Oh yeah, and he wrote great and like something turned it was into fantastic. This, this Shakespearean Jekyll and Hyde story that really transcended the boundaries of what comic books can do, and everyone noticed. Yeah, um, the the fans, the readers, the writers, the, the other artists, the producer. And they were like, this is so insanely different. Yeah, Alan Moore is one thing. That is... we need to actually make a new imprint. This can't be. And DC created Vertigo off the work off of, of Alan that. Moore. Um, uh, Grant Morrison came shortly afterwards. Uh, the, the guy who wrote like the Invisibles and yeah. stuff. And then, and then after that came Watchmen. Watchmen, yeah. He did Watchmen for DC. And there was, in the late 80s, I, I'm not, I can't remember the exact details. But long story short, DC fucked him for his rights. The corporate, the, the the industry of comics ate the medium of comics. But that was a big thing that happened, like a lot. Um, very few comic artists like got can, out with their rights, with their characters, with any of it. I mean, if I can compare it to an, an, an another metaphor, it was the it was the, the equivalent of the Montreal screw job. <laughs> yeah, essentially. That, that McMahon did to Vince to Bret Hart is what DC Comics did to Alan Moore. Fuck. Um, and you, you know, you still love wrestling. Yeah, I do. I and you still, still love, love comics. Watch, I still love comics. Oh, that is the, that is the goddamn. That is the biggest moral like quandary of like, if I like wrestling, how can I keep supporting the thing Vince McMahon does? Like but we do art, artist separation. One has to. But I, I it's, again, just as long be aware of these facts. I'm gonna watch that uh, the new Watchmen show. Yeah, because it looks really fucking looks good, cool. and I love those characters. And it looks. I mean, it's it's no slight to the creative forces behind it. It's just 
situationally it's come from how much, a dishonorable place. But actually, how much do you believe that you own your characters and how much do you believe that they're actually, once you put them out there, belong to the public? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I like to think... I like to think that the characters and even the stories are there to begin with. I'm just the guy who found them and are telling those stories. That's kind of our belief about everything. It's yeah, really esoteric. Point we're we're view, vessels right? for yeah. thoughts and ideas and stories. But yeah. then, obviously, there are practical copyright monetary concerns. This is where and, stuff gets complicated. Yeah. Um. I I don't know. I I think it's it's. It's difficult <laughs> it's, it's, to say, man. I would love to. I would love because it, it indicates, firstly, and. Well, I mean, you're writing Shaka, who's a character, like, that's yeah, universal yeah. almost. Like, it's um, a weird thing, like... Yeah, but there's... It's a very different but, thing, but, but like, yeah. No, no, there are similarities, but there's there's no actual legal, like... No, no one, one created Shaka. the character of Shaka, yeah. It's yeah. not like I'm infringing on copyright. There are con- political concerns, but but with, so with uh, actual intellectual property, like, you create a comic book character, there are... I mean, there's copyright. There's yeah. Who owns this character? Because who's got the IP? But I think it Because you shouldn't necessarily be able to make work out of someone else's... Make money out of someone else's characters. Imitation but is the best form of flattery. People are using your characters. It's, it's mean, nice Marvel, in one way, but at yeah, the same just, time, if someone... Like, let, let well, me, just put Marvel and DC's lineups next to each other and tell me that those aren't the exact same fucking characters. Exactly. Let me give you an, an, another similar example. The uh, Endgame is, is powering forward to the highest grossing movie of all time, right? Yeah. Billions and billions of dollars. How many of those dollars do you think the creators of those characters, the original creators, get? How many dollars do you think? Yeah. They get fuck all. They get nothing. Well, unless their names are Jack Kirby and Stan Lee. Well, they're dead. So yeah. they ain't getting shit either. <laughs> yeah, but, well, their but, families. Yeah. You know, no, what okay, I mean. that's a whole nother kettle of fish. But, <laughs> like, but, yeah. but the original. The, I mean, the politics of the comic book industry. Stan Lee like, created, you know, a, a lot, lot of them, them and, and put together the universe and stuff. But there were a lot more people involved yeah. in the creation of those characters what, yeah. artists and writers and various continuity. And those... But that's what I'm saying. Like, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee are the two people that everyone knows in Marvel Comics. And DC's got Bob Kane and Bill Finger. Yeah. Hey, you've probably heard of one and not the other. I know Bob Kane. Yeah. yeah. Bill Finger was the other guy who created Batman. He's the Jack Kirby of DC. Didn't get shit. <laughs> oh, he should. Okay. Um, but... Yeah, I know Bob Kane. Bob Kane was wild. Like, just like a bit of a... Yeah, but, a but shock. This, and uh, another, another... Well, another quote for the... Uh, imminently quotable Alan Moore. Um, the... The media, the, the industry of comics and the medium. Co- I love. Oh wait, her, his quote was, "I love the medium of comics. I hate the industry of comics." But and I feel that is applicable to any every, every single yeah. industry. Yeah. Like, of everyone They're can say not that. The same. And the MCU, make no mistake, is an industry. Yeah. It is not a medium. Um, the medium is the creative part. The medium is is where those characters are birthed, how they're created, who creates them. But the, the industry is shove them all together in a three hour movie. They get four minutes screen time each. No, Endgame was pretty dope. I'd be like, I'm <sighs> sorry. Okay, do I have to go through the Romeo, the previous 15 movies? Kind can of. I just pick it up? Kind of. Like, watch Infinity War, then Endgame. Okay, that'll do. I can probably guess what happened previously. Yeah, too. like, as I said, like, I haven't watched, like, Ant Man and Wasp. I haven't seen, like, a fair portion of the films. Mm-hmm. And, like, I was pretty able to pick it up because you, you watch do, Black Panther. Yeah. Like, but the thing is, you don't need to, like... Also, in general, like, I don't need exposition. I don't need story. Like, put me in the middle of any fucking thing. I'll figure out who it is. <laughs> like, and It's not indicative of good writing. What do you mean? Being able to watch, start a movie in the middle and know what's going on. Like, in, in anything, I can do that. Okay, like, well, that's, no, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. That's the... Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, as someone who, like, figures, like, you know, like, writes stories a bit and, like, you know, yes, has read okay, and cool. watched stories, like... I can just watch any fucking movie and like if you miss the first ten minutes, half the time it's okay. Like yes. and so okay. the so Endgame is essentially missing the first half hour of like the Marvel universe and then the rest like oh, okay, alright, all right. So I see what you mean. Okay, that's fine, I'll pick it up. Yeah, you you'll you'll be able to come into the film and go, I know who these guys sure are. I'm good- not entirely sure which story you guys are telling with them, but here yeah, let's go. Story, but yeah. yeah, no, but you know like how it's not the same as the comics yeah. like obviously because which comics do you pick and i like having also what i like about the mcu is yeah having like a canon that's not going to be able to really be changed yeah. so i appreciate that we've got characters who are now dead dead 
Like that's dope. Really? Yes, it really. Needs to be seen. Well, unless like unless some people uh you know resign some contracts. <laughs> those characters. Well, that's, the, that's the other thing about about these superhero movies is the worst possible thing I could I could think for an actor is to sign on to a superhero franchise. What do you mean? Okay, well maybe for for, for the like money. Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, but money. But if you're a young if you're a young up and coming actor or something, you are going to be in that for ten years and you're going to be typecast. Have you ever heard of fuck. job security? Yes, but again, I suppose. Okay, all right. Well, I suppose. It'll be, it comes down to what you want to do with your career. If you're yeah. happy with that, if you're happy with being as one character for ten years, go for it. But, but I then think, you're then no, you're catering to think, industry no, more. No, but th- but then I think it's up to you to be able to then take smaller roles and do well with it. Like yes. you can then take indie films. You can do so much with your life well, give, because you've done like fucking ten years of fucking being Spider Man. Now you can now like it's yes. the same thing with Daniel Radcliffe and fucking like you know he got to do that crazy film. <laughs> like, yeah, but what well, that's Swiss Army Man. Yeah, that dude. was weird. <laughs> but but uh, okay, to use another example, the example I was actually going to use is Robert Pattinson, Cedric Diggory, yeah, yeah. and also the, well, the vampire. The, the, yeah, yeah, definitely. But, and that love kid, him as that guy Man. had major danger of being typecast. He was. I was like, how the fuck is this guy kid going to get out of these roles? Yeah. But he, I think he deliberately, after yeah, Twilight, you go against top. He went and he went out and sought out some really indie, really obscure, really good roles and filmmakers. And some of the stuff I've watched of him is really good. And it's like so far removed from... He's a good actor. He's a young actor. But then I've also heard his name bandied about as a new Batman. And Mm. firstly, everyone's going, Oh, he's Twilight. Oh, fuck. He's going to be terrible. The thing is, I think he'd be brilliant. I think he's got the jaw. I think he'd be... If you took a youthful Batman, I think he would be really good. But I would never want to waste a young acting talent like that guy on a franchise. Like, we need a fucking another Batman movie. We definitely don't. We don't. Like... But there will be one. There will be one. I just hope it's not Pattinson, because I like him. And I think he's got a lot of good roles in him that do not require see, this him is, to be but, a superhero. You see, this is what I'm liking about the joke and what I think the DC actually needs to so, do more of. My back teeth are floating, buddy. What do you mean? Uh, can I use the commode? Oh, uh, okay, cool. <laughs> sure. Take a quick one. So yeah, I definitely think the thing that uh, DC should focus on at the moment is doing stuff like this Joker, like doing alternative universe stuff, Mm. like actually making character driven stories, you know, like, and not, not making a canon. Well, I think, I mean, even now the DC's Suicide Squad is not in the canon anymore, is it? uh, I hope not. DC's cinematic universe hasn't quite met with the same success as Marvel's has, but because it sucks. People are familiar if, familiar with the characters and the universe now. So I think there is a space to start doing Elseworlds sort of stories. There are doing... There is a... There's a movie. I don't think it's associated with either Marvel or DC. But there's a movie coming out called... I, don't, I can't remember what it's called. But it's about a, a thinly veiled Superman character who... It starts as a familiar... Shazam. No, no, no. It's a familiar <laughs> origin story... Of, I don't think it is. It's not Superman because they couldn't get the rights. It's not part of. But it's it's, it's this kid. Uh, they found this kid. But the, it's what if Superman was a baddie? Okay. What if Superman? And, and it's it's angled as almost a horror movie. I've just watched the trailer, but the trailer shifts. So, yeah, from a, that, it plays that, with that's your the thing. So this is like your red sun. Like yeah, it plays with the perception. Even the trailer does it. It plays with the perception that okay, that you're watching an origin story for a superhero, and then suddenly it veers into. Hang oh, on, this is like if the, Superman. Oh, this was is like a, the boys. A, yeah, the yeah, and that's they're also making yeah, yeah. a TV show of that. Yeah, like, tentatively keen. Uh, it looks good, but I think that that is and the boys is just good source material. The boys like, is great, but I think the the TV show um, could be really good. Yeah, because it can play not it can play with we do hero worship we hero worship superhero movies. Yeah, not just so that. Like, but no, no, like no. in general, but, I mean, when when the boys when this original comic book the boys. Uh, the, in a nutshell, The Boys, for our listeners at home, The Boys is a comic book by... Uh, so who is it by? I think it's Garth Ennis. Okay. Garth Ennis, yeah. Uh, Guy who wrote The Preacher, about this this, this team of trench-coated badasses who police the superheroes. Because the superheroes are not nice people. They're no. assholes. They're, they're, they're deviants. They're reprobates. They're, they're celebrities. But think like... 
like if R. Kelly was a superhero. Yeah, exactly. Like you know, doing guys, coke, fucking yeah. like you know. And the boys workers, are this like this team of uh, this, this sort of black ops team who have to keep them in check, and they're making a TV show of it. But when the original comic came out, the superhero universe didn't exist on screen. There wasn't yeah. um, there wasn't this. It wasn't a pop culture phenomenon as it is now. And make no mistake, regardless of my feelings on superhero movies, oh, it's a goddamn it is undeniable. Like, they are ingrained in popular culture. Yeah. And I think the TV show can be could be very clever if it actually in used criticizing that. it or just in commenting on it because it's not only a show about people about a bunch of guys policing superheroes. It's a show about a world where superheroes are idolized, and yeah. in a way, that's our world. We yeah. don't have actual superheroes, but we certainly have the sort of hero worship. They are role models. They're supposed to be, even if they're not real people. But it's also what I liked about the boys was like it's a critique of both um, comics. Well, not comics, superheroes. But also real life hero worship, like in terms of sports, yeah. in terms of politics, yeah. in terms of, you know, the person that you think is this great, wonderful, you know, like upstanding citizen is doing fucked up shit behind the scenes. Yeah. And, it's, and that's the principle of the boys. Power. And that's what I love about it. And also the fact that. W- like you talk about great people, characters. There are a lot like, of people. This is, this is the, the Me Too age. This is the age of, of uh, the patriarchy is falling, man. These, yeah. these powerful men are coming down. Good. Um, but I think that can be played with a lot because these men have been, Idolized even now, so people we look at, we see on screen idols, there they are dark, there are darknesses. Kevin fucking a lot spacey of dog. But I mean, even people we don't know about yeah. yet. Yeah. Um, the fact that there's so much that we is coming out in the last two years, there's more. This is well, a tip actually, of an iceberg. Actually, in a weird way, Hollywood is like superhero. Like, I get what you're saying there, and it's in a way, but like, extending on that, actors are essentially like the superheroes yeah, that we worship. The, it's like, the celebrity status. It's the, it's the rock star, man. Superheroes yeah. are just another well, the, version of it. Yeah, I mean, that's what The Boys essentially does correlate a lot. Like, yeah. it essentially makes these superheroes rock stars like and that's what makes it so fun like because it's an ide- it's an identifiable world yeah it's, it, it's in a way it's again going back to it's humanizing superheroes very much and this, so. well superheroes and but they're actually super villains it's humanizing them with very the worst parts of humanity well they, they are they are still superheroes though they still they're are perceived as superheroes but they're, they're still doing superhero things like they're bad people mm. doing good things like in public so they're still publicly being superheroes they're still publicly being good guys but behind the scenes, yeah. they're just these absolute fucking deviant assholes. And Build a so, wall of good deeds around you to hide the darkness that you truly are. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's actually, I guess, where we're at. So, whilst you're hating on, like, the MCU, and probably justifiably so, and I can definitely hate on the DCU because, oh, that is justified. <laughs> like, completely and utterly. They're both the same elephant, blind man. They're not the same elephant. One is way fucking prettier. Okay. One, one, Whatever like one say. has lipstick on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a bow on its tail. Right? Exactly. It, it's pretty. It looks nice. I enjoy it. Um, it's toenails. it's standing on the right ball for me. You know, the other <laughs> one, I don't like the color that the ball is painted. Ah, but what I do like is because of the culture of comic books and superheroes and stuff becoming so prevalent, we now do have anti-heroes becoming... A prevalent thing mm. like you're saying like with characters because i mean watchmen did that years ago like it, you know as a, when it came out as a movie it was very much like completely different to any sort of like comic book yeah. stuff that had come out and even as a comic it was completely different to like anything that had been coming out around it and now you know you've got stuff like umbrella academy is pretty on that point the boys is pretty on that point but and again like, none of these shows would these shows uh watchmen is, was the first one to really do it but it would would never have worked as a comic or a movie if we didn't understand and acknowledge comic what superheroes were what? um and the boys umbrella academy i haven't seen yet but no. they work for the same they work and don't work for the same reasons you need to i mean yeah without the context of knowing what a superhero is you wouldn't know what those are yeah and I mean, we I guess we just live in a world now where we know what those are, so we're always going to have that context. Uh, well, yeah, a world where we know superheroes exist. It's mm. like, it's like but I, I always like like watching horror movies as well. But it's just our it's, own mythology. We're just creating our own mythology. We're creating the contemporary gods. Exactly. What what we worshipped was the you know Thor and, and uh, Norse Thor and Loki, Greek Zeus and Hades and Aphrodite. Yeah. These are the superheroes of today, man. They're super gods. Yeah, but then you just told some pretty different stories 
Are you ever going to write a superhero? We have. Do you have a superhero in you? <laughs> Wait, that's a super I villain laugh. That's so. a tale for another time, Robert. Okay, so I guess you're working on something. I, I have many stories left to tell. Um, yeah, what stories? So, Sunday Slave, obviously, Sunday is one that you focus on. That's your character you're going to be working on for the next few years. I've got... Uh, I've, I want to finish the, the arc of Sunday Slave, conclude the, the little horror tale. Um, I would like to go back to Nero. There's still there's still sci-fi, cyberpunk. Yeah, I still I need to tell. read like the other Neros because I've only read Remembering Emma, which like, I enjoyed quite oh, a never- lot. Yeah, I haven't read really? the rest of the Nerverse, no. Oh, no dude, you've only read the, the side story then. Remember, Emma was a... a yeah, yeah, like... Shit, a, yeah. Okay, I'll bring you the other ones. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, no, sorry, I did. I, 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 no, no, that's I, my own bad. <laughs> like, um, Yeah, no, the other ones are thick. They're two 68-page volumes you need to get. I'll get them for you. Cheapers, okay. Um, yeah, remember, Emma was actually... It was a, yeah, I was in the middle. It was... It was just a. I got so, attached to one I, of the I, minor characters. I just love that the arc. Winston was in it. Yeah, like oh, the Winston plays a larger part in the in the other issues too. But yeah, um, but then I've also got. I mean, I've got other ideas for Story Press Africa, the publishers of Shark Rising. Yeah. They obviously want to do more graphic novels in graphic novels in the <laughs> in the in the vein of the African graphic novel series. At the moment, I think I'm the only guy in the stable, but. Um, but I have a lot of ideas to tell. Um, I've got a war story in mind uh, about some un- virtually unknown South African heroes in the Second World War. Uh, I'm not gonna, I won't go into it now, but I, 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 I want to tell a war story. That would be my next genre, the next thing I dabble in. So you don't want to stick to any genre? I don't see why I have to. I mean, why? Well, why, because you if enjoy... you're a writer, if you're a you yeah, know. but like, isn't there? Don't you like get an enjoyment out of writing a genre? Like, I do. Oh, of but course, once I've written some. I'll move on to the. I'll go back to it, and but it's okay. like, why? Why confine yourself? I never really understand that. Like, why? Why? why if you've told the story you want to tell for now, I'm, it's not like I'm discarding sci-fi. I have many stories left to tell in the Durban science cyberpunk universe, but um, I think it's just like taking a break. You know, do something different and energize yourself for coming back later. And I guess it also, yeah, just tickles different creative parts of your brain. And yeah, all yeah, stories yeah, have exactly. similar, you know, like all stories are the same. Like they're also, just... I mean, I mean, what I wa- I watch a lot of t uh, like, uh, well, more more television, more s- series than I watch movies nowadays. Actually, because I think there's a lot more. There's a renaissance happening in television. There's yeah, a lot more interesting creativity, long form storytelling. Television is a very different beast to what it was in like 10, 20 years yeah, ago. Yeah, nowadays something said in, se- in episode one Whereas, comes out in episode seven. Yeah, but like, you can tell a long form story that it, in some ways is like a 10, 10 yeah, you've hour got movie. To, no, that's the thing. You've got 10 hours to tell the Whereas story. Whereas yeah. movies, uh, they, it's, you've got a very confined time limit. You've got yeah. to tell a lot of story, got a lot of character work. Um, but I think stuff like there's a lot of interesting television. True Detective is particularly I've been watching is very good. Um, I like period dramas, stuff like Peaky Blinders. You um, like the, Peaky the Blinders, terror, Boardwalk Empire, stuff with. That's what got me into part, part of the reason I wanted to do Sunday Slave was also I wanted to do different outfits. Okay, I was drawing you a lot draw of people different... with cyber goggles and hoodies and stuff. I want to draw like some dudes in, in waistcoats and fedora hats and stuff. Um, so sometimes it's that simple. I just want to draw something different. Cityscapes, urban dystopias from Nero becomes, became swamplands and dust bowls and Sunday slave. Um, so just from an artistic point of view. So it just keeps view, you stimulated. Yeah. And like, um, so it's as good as a holiday, you know? Cool. And then I guess we can end with, uh, any advice to like youngsters wanting to become comic artists in South Africa? Um, yes. Read comics. That's the the biggest piece of advice I can give you is if you want to to do something, whatever it may be, familiarize yourself with what other people are doing in it. If you I, I, listen, uh, it's not the most accessible medium and it's not the most supported infrastructure in South Africa, but there is a, a, a small and solid and growing community of comic book writers and artists um, who are very supportive of each other. There's a lot of an increasing number of conventions uh, each year. My advice would be read comics, uh, attend conventions. If there's something in your town, small. I mean, it's it never it's be, never been a better time. Like, it hasn't. if you no, every year, there's more stuff to do. Like, I mean, I could imagine if I were you, I would be loving. Like, I would wish it was like you were ten years younger, like getting into the scene, like now. Like, 
I, I, yes, man, I still think about that sometimes. But I mean, I think also I, I started, I knew what I wanted to do from an early age. Yeah, you've always known, that. but like there's just, there's more support structures in place. Yeah. Like, it is m- easier now. Um, practically speaking, read comics, go to conventions. And although it's something I'm still bad with, use social media. Instagram, although not built intrinsically built for comics it's multi photo well, yeah. is perfect for comic panels you can you can write three panel comics and get a reach well, that printing does that also no. yeah social media there's no printing yes. overheads you don't do there's nothing so you can build a fan base on social media on facebook on instagram on twitter use it Just you kids are more general. familiar with it than i am uh so yeah those three points man read comics go to conventions and use social media that's the best practical advice i can give cool well, I think uh, that brings us to the end. Thank you very much for bringing some beers along. Thank this you, Bob. This has been quite a long one. I don't know if anyone's going to listen all the way through to the end. But if I you wouldn't. did, yeah. But if you did, thank you very much for Nerd Talk with uh, Bob and Billy. No, <laughs> but you. this has been a very fun one. Thank you very much, yes. bro. Thanks. Take it easy. But take it. <laughs>